Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday. Tuesday, casual Tuesday. Wednesday, casual hump day. Thursday, casual thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, July 9th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live deaths from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Pascal Robert, co-host of This Is Revolution, contributing writer at Washington Spectator and HuffPo. Meanwhile, two U.S. citizens held in the wake of the fascination of the Haitian president. And the Delta variant rampant amongst the unvaccinated in this country and growing. The U.S. West braces for another deadly heat wave. Meanwhile, the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan is essentially over. Speaking of over, ICE will no longer detain immigrants who are pregnant, postpartum, postpartum, or nursing. Biden also to issue today a sweeping executive order pushing various anti-monopolist policies. Democrats in deep internal negotiations over the infrastructure bill. Schumer pledges to include civilian climate core Pelosi pledges to not include a drop in the Medicare eligibility age. Meanwhile, Texas lawmakers innovate a new way to prohibit women's control over their own bodies and launch a second effort at suppressing vote the vote in Texas. Lastly, Pepsi boycott launched in support of Kansas Frito-Lay workers who are on strike. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining us on this Friday. Uh, joining me as always, Emma Vigland. Emma, I see that you uh, you you sort of made a half-hearted attempt to uh, to copy what I was wearing today. I did. Um, you know, if it helps you sleep at night, it was intentional. I just said, I want to, I want to be you. I want to be in my fifties and graying and all of those things. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Uh, it'll take a little bit of uh, makeup and uh, a little hard, hard living uh, to get here uh, quicker than, than, than time would allow. But yes, no, I sleep with actually one eye open. Uh, it's, there's a, there's a big um, uh, single white female vibe. Do you know? Did you know that movie? Yes, I do. I do know yeah. the single white female vibe. Uh, but I do appreciate you did not wear the glasses today. So yeah, but I mean, I've can got tell us apart. Uh, yes, yes. I hope the audience understands um, who's who at this right. point. Right. Well, well, unfortunately, we do have uh, our names put right in the corner there, so that makes it uh, easier. Um, uh, we got a lot to talk about today, and um, Pascal will be on to talk about both the what's going on in um in in haiti and uh also the he's a uh he's a queen's native and i want to get his opinion on the eric adams race and also how that ties in to the narrative that um that some democrats are trying to push uh regarding the the, the radical sloganeering that apparently is taking place that um is the reason why um, moderate uh, Democrats can't seem to win elections properly. We will talk about that. We will talk also about the uh, Delta variant and this it, it really astonishing. <laughs> There's a couple of different dynamics. Uh, Pfizer is trying to convince the FDA 
to approve of a third shot, a booster shot. And the U.S. government is saying, like, we have no data that suggests that it's needed at this point. Uh, I think it's quite clear that the um, the vaccines are safe. But the question is, do you really need a third vaccine? Maybe ultimately we might. But and and shouldn't we also be focusing on trying to get um, more people with their first and second shots, particularly in the wake of what's happening with the Delta variant? Uh, really horrific stories coming out of uh, some states, particularly in the Midwest, of um, of doctors in uh, you know in intensive care units saying they've got a ton of patients who are who just regret not taking it seriously and thinking it was a joke and thinking that it wasn't real. Um, and the, the overwhelming, it's almost, I mean, if you're going to speak in, if you're going to speak in generalities, you could basically say, you know, broad generalities, essentially no vaccinated people are dying. You know, uh, the, in, in, in May, the AP uh, looked at the numbers, found 18,000 uh, deaths, 150 of those were the unvaccinated, uh, excuse me, were vaccinated uh, twice. Um, Fauci has made similar claims about what's happening in June. All the indications that we have, at least anecdotally, uh, support that um, that work by the AP. Um, so if you're going to speak in, in just broad generalities, you're not going to die if you get the um, uh, vaccine. Uh, from COVID. Um, certainly there are some, but um, uh, to the extent that there are some too, uh, it, it um, it's a specific cohort, people who are already vulnerable uh, to, to COVID. We will talk about that later in the program. We're also going to talk about this new law in Texas. Six-week uh, ban, uh, a ban on abortion, six weeks into a pregnancy. And the innovation here is the way the state is hoping to get away from the, the question of whether it is constitutional for a state to abridge that right, they have said that the, the state government cannot enforce this law, that this only creates a civil action. Literally, someone you could sue someone if you found out that they had an abortion. Six so, weeks. You still have to have standing, but uh, I mean, <laughs> exactly. Well, aside from standing, you also need to prove uh, damages. Um, right. I mean, and and so, uh, but we will get to that. It is in this environment, like to you and I, it seems like a slam dunk. This can't go anywhere. But you're talking about state court judges in Texas, maybe. Uh, and you're also talking about a U.S. Supreme Court that is, the, you know, such such questions of consistency are um, are not foregone conclusions when we're talking about this court. But let's uh, get to um, what else we have today. Here is, um, this is just, uh, I, I don't know, incredibly unhelpful. And um, I wanna unhelpful say Unhelpful to whom though, Sam? Well, I, yes, yes, yes. To, just about everybody's interests except for steve schmidt Let's <laughs> exactly play this clip. Right. And, the, and the lincoln project and by that i mean is i take what happened on january 6th very seriously um it is highly problematic uh there must be a both i think in, in specific uh situations criminal uh price to pay but there also needs to be a political price to pay um for what took place and who was involved in it ProPublica has come out with um, some findings that are, are very preliminary and uh, reporting that, that suggest that there was a contact with White House aides between um, uh, those people who crashed the, the Capitol and, and whatnot. I do think there are questions, you know, there are situations where there is uh, uh, hyperbole um, that is, um, you know, un, unhelpful, just broadly speaking. But um, I think, you know, I don't I don't know that we've crossed that threshold. I think there was unhelpful uh, hyperbole about, um, you know, what some people call Russia gate, uh, because what happens is it makes it much easier for people to deny some of the realities associated with this. And um, 
that hyperbole was both on the uh, on behalf of like people who are promoting um sort of wild uh theories about russia and donald trump but also on the people who were com in complete denial um at one but point, this certainly crosses the threshold of hyperbole what's without a doubt yeah. without a doubt right and um here is uh and that's my point is this is an example of like this is destructive in multiple multiple ways to everything except for steve schmidt's bank account um here is steve schmidt where where is it where was this guy is this, this is during a uh, lincoln project broadcast yeah okay so lincoln project they're they're starting their own media company so here is uh steve schmidt during a lincoln project <laughs> remember this is the guy who was going to hang with Howard Schultz for as long as he'd get paid. And if that meant Howard Schultz was going to run in the general election, this guy was going to make millions, probably still made uh, well deep, deep into the six figures. But here we go. My friend Matthew Dowd, our friend, you know, talked about this. He couldn't be more right. The one six attack for the future of the country is a profoundly more dangerous event than the 9-11 attacks. And in the end, the one six attacks are likely to kill a lot more Americans than were killed on the 9-11 attacks, which will include the casualties of the wars that lasted 20 years following it. Which wars? Which wars, though, Steve Schmidt? I mean, it's, it's interesting. Well, I mean, he, it's funny that he decides to talk about war there, given the candidate that he backed in 2008 who supported the Iraq war, given the Republican Party that he was a part of uh, every step of the way that was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan, the responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of American uh, troops, and let alone... 9-11 itself was more deadly than the January 6th insurrection. I mean, please. It's just it's just bizarre. I mean, it's a total disregard, of course, for the humanity of all the people that we killed, like you say. I mean, uh, we killed hundreds of thousands of civilians, uh, particularly in Iraq. Uh, we also should say, you know, when you talk about the torture regime, you talk about the increased spying on Americans, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the spying on Muslims, uh, in this country, uh, the, um, the, the increase in, in just the, the, the diminishment of our civil liberties. Uh, I mean, we could go on and on the, and, and, and to say this kind of thing, you know, uh, makes it just sound, it's just a way for him to sell more videos or whatever it is, uh, that they're doing over there. It really is. Uh, pathetic. I mean, the the we, there's there's been so many attempts, and, and not just on uh, on that side. You know, there was. Uh, uh, I'm reminded of a piece that uh, you know Matt Taibbi wrote about the the whole RussiaGate thing. You know, having the same implications, being as uh, b being the worst thing that the press had done since um, you know the Iraq War. And I think you know, I mean, arguably, but the implications. It's. Uh, the implications are so dramatically different uh, that by, you know, unless you're going to measure some type of very narrow technical uh, definition of those things, the implications of what was done, of what 9-11 um, led us to do in this country in terms of killing people and the implications of the media uh, hyping uh, the Iraq war, all of which led to hundreds of thousands of people dying. That's the way you measure implications. Well, uh, I think you the way you measure implications, Sam, is that the implications of 9-11 got Steve Schmidt to get rich, so he doesn't consider them a threat to American democracy. But the implications of uh, January 6th and playing that up as awful as the wake of 9-11, that also gets uh, Steve Schmidt rich. So those are kind of the, the way, that's the way we're supposed to measure it, I guess, when analyzing these things. Whatever makes Steve Schmidt rich could be dangerous for the country or <laughs> vice versa. Something or, that. yeah, just that's the, right. that's the ballast. All right, we're going to take a uh, quick break. When we come back, uh, we're going to be talking to Pascal Robert. He is the co-host of This Is Revolution, contributing writer at Washington Spectator and HuffPost. Uh, we'll be back after these words from our sponsor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, got a couple of sponsors today. Um, 
I've told this story uh, many times. I'm going to tell it again because it's a great story. Uh, a couple of years ago, my sisters and I decided that uh, we wanted to make sure that my mom was eating well. And she's, uh, you know, her cooking, um, she's not cooking as much. And we wanted to make it easy. We wanted to make it uh, healthy. We wanted to make it um, tasty. So my sister, to be fair, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to steal any valor. She uh, did a lot of research on this. She's very good about stuff like that. And she decided we're going to send uh, mom freshly. But we knew mom wasn't going to accept chef made nutrient packed delicious meals delivered directly to her door if um if she knew that we were paying for it because she'd say like i can't let you pay for that and so we told the little white lie told my mom that freshly was advertising with the company with the uh the show and they gave me a lifetime free uh meals hint hint yes and um <laughs> and she loved it she, she, I mean, she, she, she was like, oh, this is so fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'm telling all my friends, I'm so glad they're advertising with you because they're delicious. And my mom's favorite meal was the steak peppercorn. I, I just ever, love how the, I love how the lie was based on some like 1970s game show, show prize, right? Where, you know, you get free meals for life or right, free exactly. chicken for life if you win this, yeah, right? I mean, look, you know, uh, my mom is, uh, was, uh, I guess she's actually a great generation. Uh, maybe she was a boomer. I'm not sure, but you right. Know. You, you made it contextual. Yeah. And, um, and then coincidentally, I don't know, six months ago, freshly decides to start advertising with us. Very exciting. Freshly, uh, your meals arrive, cook and fresh every week. You can keep your fridge stocked and skip uh, the trip to the store. Ordering is super easy. Freshly.com. You choose from over 30 meals like my mom's favorite steak peppercorn. Maybe the least they could do is like name it after my, I don't know, they probably wouldn't do it. Sausage baked penne or their chicken pesto bowl. Uh, freshly can fit your lifestyle with a variety of plans and meals to pick from. They're super flexible, folks. And now, majority port listeners can try Freshly for just $6.16 per meal. Your meals are ready to heat and enjoy in just three minutes. So right now, Freshly is offering our listeners 40 bucks off your first two orders when you go to Freshly.com slash majority. You can stop stressing about dinner. Go to Freshly.com slash majority for $40 off your first two orders. That's Freshly.com slash majority for $40 off your first two orders. Also, folks, Emma's favorite sponsor, Summer's here. Living is uh, not easy if you get swamp ass very uh hot and wet these days so um jesus christ yep <laughs> uh but how do you prevent that well refreshing spray from your hello tushy bidet <laughs> yep the brand new hello tushy 3.0 modern bidet attachment is here folks uh if you are like me and you have the 2.0 time to upgrade if you are like um many americans who have yet to realize why the rest of the world um, is way ahead of uh, way ahead of us on this, uh, or just like why it's just more hygienic, uh, hygienic and pleasant, frankly, to use a bidet. Then Hello Tushy 3.0 is for you. It doesn't just clean your butt with a precise stream of fresh water; it also cleans itself with their Smart Spray Automatic Nozzle. It attaches to your existing toilet. This is the this is one of the two features that I think. It really surprises people. One, super easy to uh, install. You don't have to, no electricity. You don't have any extra plumbing. It's super easy to install. It cuts toilet paper use by 80%, pays for itself in a few months because it is is really, really um, a reasonably priced. People get intimidated when they hear about um, bidets. This is, you got to check this out. Hello Tushy has your ass covered also with a 60 day risk-free guarantee, a 12 month warranty. If you're new to the revolution, know that you're joining millions of happy Hello Tushy customers. Defeat swamp ass, go to hellotushy.com slash majority, get 10% off plus free shipping. Special offer for our listeners at hellotushy.com slash majority for 10% off, hellotushy.com slash majority. And lastly, uh, somebody sent me a link 
to a story in Mass Live at MassLive.com. Um, I, I think that's like what the Globe came through. I don't know. I used to uh, read the sports through there. And it is a story about apparently um, one of the guys who works at Sunset Lake Sebede, um is from Worcester, graduated from Clark. And um, TJ, he is um, um, the one who is like putting stuffing into the boxes of, of Sebede that you get from Sunset Lake all of the third party documentation about what's in it. And this story is um, about Sunset Lake growing in popularity in Massachusetts. They're from Vermont. And they've got uh, that connection uh, to Worcester, uh, TJ and myself, uh, because uh, they've been advertising on this show. Um, TJ was quoted as saying each of these uh, products are supposed to have test results attached to them, but usually you don't find those. Well, with Sunset Lake, they include them and they have them posted on their website. Details the products, exact milligrams inside their packages and often, like I say, inserted by uh, TJ. Uh, he also said, we make sure all our test results are up on the website, very visible. We post our phone number. We have some open social media channels. You can reach out to us on the website with a question to ask us. We want to help. Their products include gummy bears, uh, fudge this is delicious, uh, coffee. They have uh, topical lotions and salves. They have smokables pre-rolls uh what am i tincture which helps me sleep dramatic dramatic help in my sleep um all sorts of really wonderful products and uh, they have all of the documentation up there they um use only organic fertilizers they are pesticide free they use integrated pest management uh, up on this farm and uh these guys are our movement partners they write about this um in uh in this piece that uh sunset lake teamed up uh in, in part with me to help raise funds and bring attention to striking nurses at st st vincent hospital in worcester and incidentally they've been on strike now for i think close to 120 days maybe a little bit more they just met um they were just flew down to uh, texas because uh, management is is negotiating again after trying to hire scabs uh they donated 2500 bucks to those nurses and um uh, their movement partners and uh according to and this is the part that i found really gratifying they were talking about our you know relationship with them sponsoring the show and uh tj says many of those orders those initial orders that really helped their business have turned into repeat customers Listeners of the, of the show are able to use the coupon code left is best, a slogan of the show to re receive 20% off. Repeat customers means that those folks who have ordered really know the quality of this product. Uh, so uh, check it out, sunsetlakecibidee.com. All right, I uh, wanna welcome back to the program, Pascal Robert, he's the co-host of This Is Revolution. He is a contributor to the Black Agenda Report uh as well as a washington spectator and huff post uh pascal is joining us right now from i believe florida pascal thanks for joining us again thank you for having me again sam how are you today i'm doing well i'm here with uh, emma vigland um, hey pascal hey emma how are you i'm good how are you doing okay is my audio working all right your audio is working great and uh wanted to to uh talk to you about a couple of things that are in the news these days um first off uh there's been a an assassination obviously in haiti uh you actually heard, you heard about that i did hear about that and in fact uh we reported on the other day um Moise, am I pronouncing his his, his name? Moise. Moise. Oh, okay. By the way, Moise is the French name for Moses. Okay, so Moise um, uh, was assassinated. Um, just do do us a favor. Will you just go back and give us some very remedial uh, information? Because you know, people, I think, I mean, I learned this frankly from 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 Michael uh, Brooks in in the interviews that he did uh, years ago. But but prior to that, there was virtually I never 
heard any history, not uh, in school, not in the context of why we have had such ongoing um, uh, involvement in, in Haiti. Will you talk uh, just briefly about the Haitian independence and the implications that really Haiti has represented for, um, for uh, well, I mean, a couple, a uh, century and a half at least uh, in, in this country? So you're asking me to basically sum up 200 plus years of history in a, in a short conversation. I think I can do that. No yeah, pressure. I knew you could. That's yeah. why I asked. Basically, if you understand the situation relative to Haiti is to put Haiti's uh, revolutionary independence uh, struggle that started in 1791 in the context of its proximity to the U.S. history. When the Haitian Revolution started in 1791, George Washington was president of the United States. So we have to understand in, rel in relativity to these two factors that the importance of Haiti to the development of the United States in the 19th century and, and even uh, after its initial founding was very, very important because prior to Haiti's independence, the Republic was called Saint-Domingue under the, under the auspices and control of the French. Haiti was, the colony was actually more valuable to the French, then all 13 colonies were, va were of value to the British because the trade in sugar, particularly sugar, coffee, tobacco, but particularly sugar and rum made it one of, if not, if not the most valuable uh, colonies in the slave plantation system that existed in the Western Hemisphere. So one of the things you have to understand as well is that contrary to it's in the consciousness of a lot of people who look at slavery in the American context as being so brutal, so horrible, the French plantation system in Haiti was absolutely egregious. If any of you, I'm sure you guys have read Black Jacobins, which is a book I have some issues with for various problems. They used to do things like bury slaves in sand and put molasses on their head and have maggots and ants eat at their face. They would put gunpowder in the anal orifices of Africans who were rebellious that literally have them explode. The type of tortures that the French would engage in with the African plantation, Africans on the plantation was absolutely brutal beyond words. So much so that the average life expectancy of an African slave who was brought to the island as a young adult or an adult will be no more than five to seven years. So in other words, you bring an 18 year old African slave to Haiti, at best, he's gonna to live to maybe what, 25, 26, and he's gonna die. And one of the reasons why the French did not care about that is if you read actually French writings, they would say things like the shores of Africa are always generous. They basically believe that they could just keep coming in and importing and importing and importing more and more Africans. And if they died like flies, it didn't make a difference. That was fine. So much so that several of the other colonies, because of the rebellious nature of the, the these Africans on these plantations, were a little bit leery of ex importing such large numbers, which did affect some of the, Amer the United States at a certain point in terms of its attitude towards importing Africans. So what basically happens is that in 1791, a group of uh, mostly African slaves have a ceremony that is known by Haitian, a uh, ceremony Bwakaimo, where they basically created a united front religiously. Some of them were animists or voodooists, some of them were Muslim, and they basically came together and decided to unify their, their, their various religious diversity that they would have had on the African continent in a kind of spiritual pact to join together to fight the French plantation owners. So they started after they had that ceremony a week later, they had a, they started savagely just burning and killing uh, European plantation or French plantation owners by the by the by the hundreds. They killed like a couple of thousand within a week. So this violent this this violence starts to expand and expand and expand. And it's basically just guerrilla warfare. And what happens is that because the island was so valuable. The French have competitors in this exploit. Don't forget the other half of the island, which is now the Dominican Republic, is controlled by the Spanish. The Spanish seeing that the French are basically going through chaos, and this is also proximate to the French Revolution, are saying, you know, listen, we can come in here and we can actually say, we're gonna promise these Africans that we're gonna free them and we can fight the French, get them out of here. And we can like free some of them and actually still have some slavery for, for others who are a lower class. And you know, this can work out for us. So what happens is the Spaniards 
come into the island and they actually start to train some of the more high level slaves like Toussaint Overture and others as soldiers officially in the Spanish army to fight against the French to maintain control of the island because the Spanish are like, this is a lot, this is a lot of money here, man. We're going we're gonna to keep this. And what happens is that, now understand something, even though the French were brutal plantation owners, all of the Africans, the Blacks, and the, the you know, mulattoes, what you would call biracials, were more culturally in affinity to the French. They spoke Creole or French. Their culture was, even though there was obviously an African dominant culture amongst the, the, the slaves, there was a, they had a more cultural affinity to the French. So when the French are realizing that the Spaniards are here helping the Africans to defeat them, so they're going to lose this island, they're like, we can't afford to lose this place. This is too expensive. This is, I mean, this is too valuable. The French come in and say, listen, for you Africans, we will free you if you agree to help us fight the Spanish and get them out of here. So the, the Africans were like, oh, great, we can be French now. This is awesome. And they basically, this is under Toussaint Louverture. They're like, okay, we'll now fight for the French. We'll turn our back on the Spaniards and we will fight and kick the Spaniards out. They, the, the, the Africans under the guise of the French fight the Spaniards, boom, they kick the Spaniards out. So now the Africans are like, oh, great. Okay, now the French are going to, you know, basically treat us fair. Everything's going to be great. Well, guess guess what happens in the room? The British who are like, all right, those Spanish are nothing, but the French are still weak. We want to come in and put both put these Africans back in shackles because we hate these French and we can take the whole island. You know, we can make it ours. So the British come in. They send their biggest uh, ex, uh, export of ships. They send like 50,000 troops to the island. And they're like, we're going to, you know, we're going to wax these Negroes and we're going to take this place and we're going to have it for ourselves and the French will be done. They came to the island, 10,000 British soldiers died in two months. Wow. That's slaughtered. That slaughtered. This was under Toussaint Louverture. As a matter of fact, if you read a book, there's a book uh, called uh, by a guy named David Gegis, and there was a story in Putin, in, his new, in, new, in newspapers in London, it was said that the, the British losses in the Haitian Revolution were so bad that there was not a single Briton, Brit, per, a British person, who didn't have someone in their family who experienced a loss in the, in, in the, in the Haitian campaigns. So, okay, the British take off. The Spanish are out, bang. The British are out, bang. So now the French are like, okay, Toussaint Louverture is governor general of the island. He's running the island. And they say, okay, listen, you can free uh, the Creole black. This is a very important. This is something that's very important, crucial detail that many people don't understand about the Haitian Revolution. There are three classes of black people in, the Haiti, in Haiti. One is pejoratively called the Bosal. You'd probably spend a B O S S A L. The Bosal were Africans that were born in Africa that were transplanted to the island. So in other words, they obviously would be a little bit more rebellious, less acculturated to French culture, and they would be used to being free. The next are the Creole Blacks. Creole Blacks are Blacks who were born on the island, but were not born in Africa. So they were more acculturated to the French system. They spoke better French. They had higher class standing than the Bosal Africans, but they were still Blacks. Some of them were slaves. Some of them were free. And the Blacks who were free sometimes owned slaves. Guess what? Two settlers were true before the Haitian Revolution actually owned Black slaves. It shocks a lot of people. And then you had the Creoles who were mulatto, who were biracial or biracial adjacent and their opinions, who were also often free but you know, hated the Blacks, wanted to be French, and owned 25% of the Black slaves. So not only do you have white people owning slaves in Saint-Domingue, pre-revolutionary age, you have Creole Blacks, and you have Creole mulattoes who own slaves, a lot of them as well. This causes a situation where the Blacks, the Creole Blacks kind of hate the mulattoes because they think they're better than them because their skin is light and they're more white, so they hate each other. The, the, uh, the uh, Creole mulattoes hate the Creole blacks, even though they're close in class standing because they're black and they like they don't want to be black. And the African Bosal hate them both because they oppress both of them. And the Creole blacks and mulattoes hate the Bosal because they're the lower rung on the totem pole and they're considered, you know, savages, Africans, so on and so forth. This class division 
plagues Haitian society to this day. So, um, and, and I want to I want to return to that a, a little bit. I mean, in terms of like what what were the were, were those factors? Well, I guess maybe now is the best time to address that part of it. Um, are those factors just driven? I mean, uh, by by both just race and culture. I mean, were they uh, in race, uh, class, culture, capital, status? You know, all, all of, of those things, is... all of those great things that dialectical materialists tell you to study if you study right. some Marx. Right. Um, all right. And so when, by the way, the, the best part is, this is a good part again, because we got out, they kicked out the British, they kicked out the French, they kicked out the Spanish. You're like, well, what happens with the French? What happens is with the French is that Napoleon takes power in French, in France, right? And Napoleon is like, I have no tolerance for any of these Negroes. I want all these guys with their epaulets on their shoulders to be ripped off, put them all in shackles or exterminate them. I want them gone. I don't want to hear anything about no two cent literature running anything or any Negroes owning slaves. So Napoleon sends, you know, squ squadrons, dragoons of squadrons to the island to basically shut this whole game down. Toussaint Louverture is kind of like worried about all oh, the French are coming. Don't forget, Toussaint Louverture up in this time never fought the French army with his own body. He, bought, he fought the English and he fought the Spanish, but he had not fought the, the French. Well, Toussaint is a little kind of hesitant back and forth. And his second in command, Dessalines, is like, listen, man, we got to take it to these French because, uh, you know, this is not going to be a good thing. Toussaint Louverture is eventually captured by the French, sent back to France, put in a prison and dies begging Napoleon to be sent back to Haiti to be his governor general again. Napoleon Bonaparte dies saying his biggest mistake was not allowing Toussaint Louverture to come back. Dessalines, who hated the French, despised them because there's another little class division between Toussaint Louverture and Dessalines. Toussaint Louverture is what you call an ancien libre or an old freed. What does that mean? When the Haitian Revolution starts in 1791, Toussaint Louverture had been a free man of color for about 20 years. So he knew freedom, he owned slaves, he owned property. Dessalines, though he was a Creole like Toussaint Louverture, was a nouveau league. He was newly freed because of the revolution that started in 1791, and he was a brutally beat slave until 1791. So he had, even though he was not a Bosal or an African brought to the island, he had approximate identification with them because he was just as brutally treated, even though he was a Creole, but he was only freed by the happenstance of the beginning of the Haitian Revolution. So there was a major divergent class worldview amongst these two men who were both black, who were both born on the island, but because of the difference in times in which they were freed proximate to the beginning of the revolution and their relationship with the French and the empires that they fought with, they had two totally, two, two totally different worldviews of both French, Europeans, and white people. And, and, and relative to the United States, and, uh, and, and, and basically I want to just bring this back to a comment that uh, Brian Concanon, uh, who, who I think you, you, you know, um, was talking about the other day on the program, um, was as to why the United States has been consistently <laughs> intervening and uh, manipulating um, Haiti. I mean, in, 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 in terms of like uh, sheer dollars, Concanon was like, it's not necessarily, he doesn't think it's just necessarily resources. It's, it's about the potential for Haiti to provide a model. Yeah, it's the fear, for, of, it's, it's the fear of a positive model. And, 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 and indeed, that was the concern, the American concern with the, with the Haitian Revolution, was that this is going to provide some type of paradigm or blueprint or model or inspiration for American slaves. For black liberation. Uh, and black, yes. black liberation, liberation. In, yeah. in the United States. Right. That's correct. Not only that, well, let me get finished to how this, what happens is that Toussaint Louverture goes, dies in the jail. Dessalines takes over the, 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 the soldiers, the Haitian soldiers. Toussaint Louverture's capture inspires them to get more aggressive. Dessalines, who was rather brutal himself, says we're going to massacre these French, and he totally defeats the French army. They are completely defeated and they go back in shame and they surrender to the country in a battle called Vertier that happens in November of 1803. And in the January of 1804, the next year, uh, Dessalines, as the president and leader of the country, declares Haiti and he changes the name from Saint-Domingue back to this original Arawak name and calls it uh, Haiti, which the long name is Haiti Kesquia da Bohio, which is Haiti, the lands of mountains and valleys. But the thing that's interesting as 
antagonistic as the United States has been to the Haitian revolution and the Haitian people, there is no country that has been a bigger beneficiary of the Haitian revolution than the United States. Because you know what happened and allowed the United States to receive as a result of the Haitian revolution? Uh, I'm, the slave trade uh, gets no. bigger there. No. no, the Louisiana territory. Ah, right. Why? Because Napoleon had sent 25,000 troops, which was actually larger than the U.S. Army, to New Orleans before he came to Haiti with a plan. He sent some troops to Haiti and some to New Orleans. His plan was like, after I beat these Africans in, in Haiti, I'm going to go to New Orleans and I'm going to conquer North America and I'm going to make all these Yankees my French colonies. That was the plan. Mind. Because the Haitians were beating him so bad, he had to change the plan, take the army that he had in New Orleans, send them to Haiti, and they got waxed as well. And his plan to actually take over North America was vanquished. And because he got beat so bad to finance his losses, he sold all of the Louisiana territory, which doubled the size of the United States to Thomas Jefferson for less than eight cents an acre. Well, which uh, made the United States the country that it is to this day. There you so go. not only do we give, get that, not only did the United States get the land that made the country, Haiti literally protected the United States from becoming a French colony. All right. So that was um, that was pretty comprehensive uh, uh, wrap up of history in a relatively short period of time. Um, <laughs> For but, sure. So I mean, so let's go to, to to present day. I mean, if we know that the 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 U.S. foreign policy establishment uh, has viewed Haiti as a threat insofar as um, it it could provide a model. Uh, for the rest of, of, you know, Latin America, Central America, um, um, uh, the, it, it could just simply the provide- Global South, the Black world, the colonized exactly. world. Exactly. Um, and so give us a sense of like what your sense is of what, what, what happened. I mean, uh, the, in terms of this assassination, uh, let's take it to present day. Oh, well, first of all, what happens in the 20th century is the United States occupies Haiti from 1915 to 1934 to literally takes all the gold out of the Haitian coffers, uh, uh, sends it to Citibank, uh, you know, violently and brutal, brutally uh, 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 abuses the Haitian people. Um, uh, it controls the economy there for some, over, almost like 20 some odd years. And Haiti basically since 1984 has never had any real sovereignty over its government. Any president that was president of Haiti, if he even altered or deviated from the United States agenda was either given a coup like Estime was in 1850 or possibly threatened with assassination. And if he wasn't, he was a complete tool and puppet of the United States like Papa Doc was, Francois Duguayé. Why was Papa Doc such a valuable tool? Because he was anti-communist in the height in the age of Fidel Castro. And so he was perfect. Use your charade of black nationalism to be anti-communist and the U.S. will support you. We got no problems. Just make sure you don't have any Haitian commies like my, my uncles in your country and get rid of them. OK, uh, so so the, the Duvalle regime is very valuable. Guess why the Duvalle regime is kicked out in 86? Because what's happening in 86, the Soviet Union is falling apart. The fear of, of communism is no longer. We don't need the Duvalle regime anymore. Goodbye. Get out. And so, um, and all right, and so, so take us up to today. Um, and so, what happens today? The next, the next regime that was actually one of the first, the first democratically elected regime, which was somewhat radical because it was actually caring about poor people, was Jean Bertrand Aristide. Jean Bertrand Aristide was a priest who was into liberation theology. Who, I mean, I mean, that's, I think that's the best thing, closest thing you can get to Marxism as a Catholic. And he wanted to do massive wealth transformation, increase the minimum wage, and do something. For for the Haitian poor, who were the descendants of those African bosals that both the Creole blacks and mulattoes looked down on and frankly didn't care about, and who made up the supermajority of Haitian, Haitians and, and the majority of the Haitians who are poor. And he realized that this class setup is horrible, and there's a Haitian oligarchy, which is made up of people who aren't even organically Haitian. Most of them are Syrian, Lebanese, Arabs, Europeans, who came to, the United, came to Haiti in the early 20th century, started businesses, and started getting major businesses business concessions under the U.S. US occupation and during the presidency of Duvalier because they supported Duvalier against the mulattoes who, who Duvalier hated or the biracial or the fair complexion Haitians. And they control literally 90% of the economy in Haiti today. That's a very person, 
important factor. The Haitian oligarchy becomes a proxy for the State Department in Haiti in that whenever a coup is needed in Haiti, it's usually organized and orchestrated by the Haitian oligarchy with the support of the U.S. State Department. We have emails of one of the Haitian oligarchs going back and forth with Clinton aides, planning elections and things of that nature. So they are what, what Franz Fanon would call the, the, uh, ne the uh, neocolonial bourgeoisie in Haiti, but they're not Haitian and they actually don't even look black. They actually look like Arabs, Syrab Syrians and Europeans. But and but Moise was definitely in that tradition, right? I mean, he was as no, much he was part of the, okay. The yeah, yeah. This is the thing. It's a, it's a little complicated, right? Right. PHTK, P -H -T -K, which was his party, which is the party Tech Calais, which is the ball, they call it the ball head party because Michelle Martelli, Martelli, who was a pawn of the US, who was put in to govern over the earthquake so the Clintons could extract as much money as they could after the earth, during the earthquake were built, rebuilding, uh, started a party called PHTK. He was president during the Haiti earthquake rebuilding, did minor rebuilding of the country, did some things that he could. But what happened is during the rebuilding, in 2010, we had the Haiti earthquake, massive devastation. We all know about it. Massive amounts of international money are flowing into the country for development, right? Cash is everywhere, even though none of it is going to the Haitian poor. Right. What this exposes to people like Martelli is that we don't have to be dependent on the Haitian oligarchy because they always extort money from the government because they're parasites. We can actually deal with international actors, get development deals done, like building roads and hospitals for a cheaper price than the oligarchies, even though it's still under neoliberalism. Because these oligarchs are such crooks, we can actually cut better deals with international actors than the oligarchs. That's when that seed is first planted in the head of the PHCK party that we can cut the oligarchs out and deal with international actors. Uh, uh, Martelli's term is up and he hand ta taps a guy who comes from the peasant lower classes. No one knew who this guy was. His name was Jovenel Moise. And they basically say, this is going to be my replacement. The U.S. okays an election, which was totally fraudulent and totally illegitimate. Moise becomes president because the Haiti, the country is forced into austerity because of a certain oil relationship with Venezuela that goes bad through the quote unquote petro, petro Carib economic uh, consignment that Venezuela gave to Haiti and Haitian oil because Haiti oil prices go up and Venezuelan oil can't be used anymore. The IMF puts sanctions on Haiti, tells Haiti, you guys got to double your oil prices. And that's the beginning of the problems for Moise. And the, the country basically goes into austerity. Much of the reason why Moise has such a crappy administration is that because the with the loss of the Venezuelan concessions forces uh, energy prices to be so high in Haiti that the country is forced into austerity. He has to cut services and poor people are suffering and they're pissed and they're trying to rebel. They're like, yo, you're not helping us out here. At the same time, because Moise is under that PHTK plan of cutting out the oligarchs, he is, when he gets into the administration, he's given four contracts like 25 year contracts that's supposed to go to the oligarchs. One is to control all the ports, which means you control all the trade. One is to control who imports the oil. One is to control who, who controls the electricity for like 25 years. And I think another one is who develops the roads in the country. These All of these contracts are exploitative as hell. They would cost like twice as much as if the state did the planning itself. But because the oligarchs have such a parasitic control of the country, they were given these, uh, these, these contracts by the prior prime minister, I think he got him, just Jusselin Previere, before Jovenel Moise becomes president. Even though Jovenel Moise was an, initially supported by one of the major oligarch families, at a certain point in line with the PHTK, PHTK is a kind of neo devourist party in which they believe that they're going to bring back the renaissance of a Black political class in Haiti to displace the kind of uh, the oligarchs who have who both even the mulatto and the black middle class kind of despise. All right. They've actually become the oligarchs became the tip, the top of the of the food chain. They displaced even the, the, the mulatto or fair complexion, complexion Haitians and even the black elites. And they were at the top of the food chain. And both those middle class Haitians despise them. So there was a belief that PHCK was going to be a revival of this kind of like duvalurous kind of like multicolored middle class kind of shtick. I didn't buy it. I thought they were ultimately neoliberal anyway. But the larger point is, is that um, Moise under the plan of like, okay, let's try to find a way to undercut 
the uh, the oligarchs, he decides at a certain point of his administration to throw those contracts in the trash. And that's when the real beef between him and certain factions of the oligarchy start getting hot. They start financing gangs. He starts financing his own reprisals. Poor people are dying left and right. He's having some of the oligarchs' businesses burnt up and destroyed. And there's basically an internal war going on between uh, Moise and the oligarchs, but because Moise is okay in the eyes of the U.S., why? Because Moise stopped, stabbed Venezuela in the back after those oil concessions and said, I don't support Nicolas Maduro, and I support um, Juan Guaido, so I have no problem with Guaido, and whatever the U.S. says is fine. He aligns himself with Trump. He's Trump's boy. Because Biden still hates Venezuela and is is has no problem with, with uh, Moise's stabbing Venezuela in the back, Biden decides, okay, he can be our boy too. He's not a problem. Okay, we don't care what he's doing with the oligarchs as long as he helps us squash squash uh, Venezuela. So he was valuable to the U.S. because he was a bulwark against the pink tide in South America and Latin America. What happens is that the beef between the, the oligarchs and Moise gets so hot because Moise is signing contracts. I posted a post on my Twitter. His, his last trip, he did a trip last month when he went to Turkey. And he had memorandums of understanding with the Turkish government to do development deals in, in Haiti. So not only did he throw out the contracts that the oligarchy was promised, he's cutting major deals to have all of the tasks that they were going to do done by international actors. Okay, so this all comes to a head and um, someone has him whacked. If you ask me who I did it, I think it was done by the oligarchy with the green light of the United States, because I think the United States said, listen, this guy's too much of a problem. There's too much chaos. If you guys can guarantee a transition to a new administration that's friendly to both the United States and you guys, the oligarchs, since the oligarchs are always in the State Department's pocket, you guys can go with it. That's my theory. Uh, that, uh, that, that, that sounds pretty strong. I mean, there's a there's a quality. It sounds like uh, when it's a question of Moise and or the oligarchs, it's uh, the United States sort of feels like heads. Uh, we win tails. We also win uh, because we've got these are the two. We've got Coke and Pepsi f fighting it out. And at the end of the day, we're still going to have our, 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 our cola, I guess. Um, and the um, the idea at that point, we just uh, apparently um, Jen Psaki uh, has said that the Biden administration calls for free and fair elections in Haiti. It stands ready to receive a formal request for assistance if it comes. Oh, so there you go. Now we're going to have the U.S. talking about we're going to come on down. That's the last thing they need. He's ready to rock and roll. It's going to be uh, Clinton, Obama 2.0. Um, so do you anticipate, I mean, who is there as you look at the, the, uh, the landscape in Haiti right now? Is there an opportunity? for who do you perceive if if anybody within the government or within haitian society who represents a possibility for an actual sort of like advancement of of democracy i think country? listen i had daoud andre who's a very well-known haitian radical activist from brooklyn on our show and he said there is no one who was trustworthy in haitian civil society the only thing that can save this country is haitian revolution 2.0 and what would that look like at that point? Like where that would, would look that... like major, 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 major attacks on the oligarchs because they're the tip of the problem, and a decision by the the uh, black middle class and and fair complexion middle class uh, with as to who they're going to align with. Because don't forget, those middle class blacks and fair complexion mulattoes they usually work for the oligarchs in their jobs. Yeah, they own I mean... the banks. They own the you know all the institutions. And so another part words, of the problem is that this class they've been co-opted team, yeah. which is destroying the lives of 75% of the country, is supported by middle class Haitians like my own family. Well, it's a bit of musical chairs, right? Because yeah, even if Moise he kind of became so problematic that he was the odd man out and the oligarchs teamed up against him. I mean, he was he made he was incredibly wealthy, right? Made his fortune. No, he was not had some corrupted he was not like oligarch wealthy he had some change he has okay change. yeah so i mean then revolution how does like how does that come to be what kind of well that's a good effort? question right yeah you know? right yeah the well, united, I, united states does not want that that's certainly in, yeah in, in regards to the haitian middle class who, who provides sort of the ballast right i mean that is that they um um it, it, i mean it sounds like you, you perceive the, the the haitian middle class as being 
um, the almost like the fulcrum of this situation. Don't forget, a lot of the diaspora makes up the Haitian middle class, even in absentia. And where? What about the the Haitian diaspora? I mean, we we have. I wouldn't uh, trust them to. I wouldn't trust them to throw a cannon because a lot of them supported the coup to get rid of uh, Aristide, and many of them just want to go back to Haiti and live bougie middle class lives with rest of peasant, you know, servants that they can you know <laughs> hang out with and sexually molest when they get a chance. Oof. All right. Uh, so um, you don't perceive that there is an opportunity. I think that there's some of them that can be. I think that the hope for the country is actually in the younger diaspora, not my parents' generation, they're, they're hopeless. The younger Haitian diaspora who is living in America realizes that all this class nonsense is idiocy. If they could really get an educational terrain and understanding the, the, what's going on in the ground, they're old enough to have resources and education. I think there's a potential if they, not, they nullify the oligarchy, people who are like, I would say 60 and younger or 50 and younger, I think that they could actually transform the country, but it could not be under a neoliberal capitalist paradigm. Let me let me just ask you this too. Um, to what extent does the cohort of Haitians who are here under temporary protected status, and they've been sort of like they were like a football, uh, I guess, in the the context of like the end of the the Trump administration, uh, wh- where where do they stand? Like, I mean, who? Well, these who, are the people who are usually poor from the peasant class who are just, you know, they they're fleeing their country, so they're refugees. They're coming to America trying to make a better life for themselves. So. They're typically trying to bounce between not getting caught caught out there by ICE and trying to like you know find some kind of menial job. They don't have really a say because they they can't vote. They're not U.S. citizens. They can't lobby the government. But we have a black we have a Haitian misleadership class as well with, with journalists at certain publications, Miami Herald and otherwise Haitian elected officials who do the same you know buck dancing worthless dance that the the black misleadership class does to the Democratic Party that usually works to the de- detriment of the Haitian people. So. Unfortunately, we are mimicking that charade within our own community. And and there and there there's no uh, there's no real uh, uh, there's no there's no power center in in the in the context of this country. There's certainly no political party that is going to change. No, uh, because the, the Democrats have actually been more toxic in the relationship to Haiti than the Republicans in the last third twenty years. Well, well, I mean, what, except for except well, for Bush, the father, because he the 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 Bushes did the Aristide coup. So I got I gotta make that one alteration well, I, I know you uh, just really i know you talked about the clintons just in terms of the like the historical progression of haiti but also can you expand on what happened in the wake of the earthquake and how via the clinton foundation outside of power really there simple. was a the, neoliberal the, the, pro- project the, Clint, the clintons use haiti, haiti as their personal atm machine right that's what, yeah that's what happened. yeah I mean, I just go into that a little bit because I don't know if people well, the, the, fully the, appreciate the, the, that. Well, well, Hillary Clinton's brother, who died, had literal contracts with gold mining in Haiti. There was gold discovered in Haiti. He had con- personal contracts for gold mining concessions, uh, which gives you a sense of, uh, you know, uh, uh, one would imagine that's probably a function of of, of her role in the U.S. government as opposed exactly. to. Uh, um, uh, Rodham, I think is his name was uh, his. Um... All right, well. Um, and so what, what do you anticipate, like, what, what do you anticipate happening? I mean, I, I mean, it's sort of like a bleak, um, a sort of near-term forecast. Welcome to Haitian life. Uh, there you go. Um, what do you, how do you anticipate this going down? Like, what is there I think any? The U, I think either, I think the U.S. is going to send a U.N. Uh, probably contingency, like Manusta that we had. After during the earthquake and after Aristide, that was horrendous. Who brought cholera to the country because they literally poured feces into the Artiboni River and gave cholera to the Haitian people? It's either going to be a, a UN uh, uh, military uh, uh, kind of minister like uh, cons- uh, uh, embarkment, or it'll be the US, which will be a nightmare because I think even America, hey, I, I don't think the Biden administration wants to take that on at this time right because that's just too much of an 800 pound gorilla in an, in an era where you know listen don't forget trump appealed to the haitians against hillary clinton he came to little my little haiti in miami and said they've done you wrong i'll do you right we could take a look at the number of haitians that voted for trump in 2016 and ask if they flipped the state in florida wow where and 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 so Biden certainly. I mean, I think the Biden administration wants to have as little, you know, uh, sort of 
um, anything but, you know, uh, three three alarm fire in terms of their foreign policy. I think that's what they're 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 not interested in engaging. They, you know, it's like the same thing with Israel and Palestine. They 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 have no interest uh, to the extent that they can in engaging in any of this. I think they'd be happy to maintain the status quo. So I would imagine no, they're going to maintain the status quo. The question is, can they can they orchestrate a sham election? effective enough to put in a puppet that will do the bidding of both the oligarchs and the Biden administration. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, um, without the Haitian, the Haitian grassroots totally just setting the country on fire. Um, I guess we will see. Um, and my guess is if they don't uh, find that person, then we'll just get another round of this type of, uh, of violence. Or there's revolution, which is, you know, your your calls for that. It fits nicely to the podcast. plug of your podcast. Yeah. Right, exactly. Revolution podcast. Check it out at your relevant social media on YouTube, Tuesday nights, 9 p.m., Thursday night, 9 p.m., also on Saturdays at noon. Also, your relative uh, rel relevant podcast apps, Apple Podcasts. This is Revolution Podcast with my great co-host, Jason Miles. Yeah, we'll put a uh, we'll put a link to that. Well, we only have about two and a half minutes left, and I wanted to get your take on... Um, on Eric Adams as a uh, as a as a former Queens native, um, make a Queens baby. <laughs> uh, but um, we only have about two minutes left, uh, so I'm not sure that we have time to 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 go into that. Uh, but well, you're the uh, one who asked me for 200 years of Haitian history, man. I mean, I know, me. I know. I'm glad I did, frankly. Um, <laughs> because we'll, we'll have more time to talk about Eric Adams. He, he will not win the general election, I guess, until uh, November, anyways. So. Uh, Maybe we'll have you back on for a bite at that apple. Uh, Pascal Robert, the uh, the podcast is This Revolu This is, this Revolution. is Revolution Podcast. And uh, we will put a link to that at majority.fm and uh, in all our uh, descriptions. Thank you so much. By the way, tonight we're having a show on Haiti with Dr. Paul McComb on This is Revolution. All right, great. Folks, just check that out. Um, and now I, I feel like uh, folks have a, at least a context and a basis uh, to understand what's going on down there right now. I appreciate that. Thanks so much for coming on. All right. Thanks, Pascal. Right. No we're going to take we're going to take a quick uh, break. We'll be back to wrap it up in a moment. Well, I wanted to get into uh, Eric Adams a, a little bit in New York. We will have time to uh, to pick that up in, in the future. But specifically, um, New York is being used by uh, members of the Democratic establishment to attack the progressives and the left flank in the Democratic Party uh, and their calls for, uh, you know, Medicare for all. And then also, uh, by extension, um, folks who were engaged in the protests in the wake of uh, the Black Lives Matter protests in the wake of the uh, Floyd killing and the calls to defund the police and 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 whatnot. And uh, we have a great clip. We talked about it with for like 20 minutes yesterday with David Friedlander. So if people want to check that out, it was on yesterday's show a little bit about Eric Adams. Great. And and take that out uh, and, and check that out. Uh, Mehdi uh, Hassan had a great uh, exchange with uh, Clyburn to sort of illustrate that dynamic um, where you still have these establishment Democrats who are attempting to frame the last of the the uh, underperformance or the perceived underperformance by uh, Democrats as a function of defund the police or Medicare for all. We know that the data shows that there really wasn't that much of an underperformance of Democrats in the House. Uh, they basically aligned with uh, Joe Biden's performance, but we will talk more about that uh, going forward in the future. If you're watching us on Peacock, we will say adieu and have a great weekend. And yes. We will see you on Monday. If you are not watching us on Peacock, then hello. 
Hi, hello again. How are you? Uh, Aaron is not cool, just I am, just said wanted to hear the crew's initial takes on the executive orders Biden announced today. We're going to do that in the fun half. We're doing a we're doing like a, a shorter Friday show for the freebies because we did a freebie the other day. Oh, we didn't do that, did we? I thought that that I've been working under the uh, misapprehension that that whole thing with um, your own uh, your own Brooke. No, it just felt like it. I thought that was part of. Oh, so there was a lot of people who didn't hear that. Uh, well, I mean, it's clipped for the YouTube channel, so. Oh, we did clip it for the YouTube. All right, folks. Well, you can check that out, that debate. Um, boy, it didn't. People really uh, took issue with your own basically saying that, you know. The, people the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. Yeah. The idea that, like, uh, you need to be responsible for the structural integrity of uh, any building that you live in. Uh, and, of course, the engineering uh, requirements, knowing the calculations on. Well, that's not entirely true, true Sam. You should check out uh, Papa the Band's uh, I Am I'm about to send. Papa the Band I Am? Oh, yes. Yeah, so essentially, though, it is it is helpful to basically have people who live in buildings who aren't up on the structural integrity yeah. of their buildings and don't do it. I mean, if they die, then it's just. It's just the weak being weeded out, obviously. I mean, that's the natural extension of your own's argument. I mean, what would your own think about 9-11, for instance? Should people like have an understanding of the terrorism, <laughs> be terror experts? And, they, I mean, yeah. yeah. Hey, if you knew enough about the integrity of steel, I mean, let's not get into that part. But uh, let's uh, let's here uh, put up that tweet, uh, Brendan. I'll read that off because it's a pretty good one. And this is look, folks. You got a lot of young people out there. You need to understand what's uh what what you're you're up against uh, when you go out into the world, um, and this is a good uh, summation. Uh, thanks to the debate, I am now a libertarian. Says Pop of the band, I am boning up on my understanding of electrical and plumbing codes, learning about building uh, integrity, looking into my doctor, looking into the numbers that make me think my doctor is a good doctor, looking into who is behind. <laughs> Every study about medicine and every medical decision this doctor is going to help me make also became a mechanic so I can buy a car without the safety of a lemon law. Dude, limitarianism is great. Um, Papa, you are shirking some of your responsibilities in terms of finding out the um, uh, uh, some of the of, of hiring a food inspector for your food supply. And of course, checking that your water is safe for you to drink and that um and is has he looked into the background of us on the show our funding has he done any research about I mean, uh sam's yes. long history of organized crime there are a lot of things that uh didn't have to you didn't have to bring that part up but okay well i i'm trying to shield myself from liability deflect so yes, nobody I looks understand. into that attempted murder charge on my record so anyways kids uh, if you're headed out to, uh, the, 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 um, it's, you know, heading out to the real world, I guess we could say this for, you know, recent graduates, uh, bone up. Um, so you get a lot of stuff you gotta know to be, to, to really ad be doing adulting, as we say, <laughs> folks, it is, we your do, we do, we do what adulting? we do say that. We do say adulting. Yeah, of course. No, yeah. Um, folks, uh, you can support this show by becoming a member at Join the Majority Report. To oh, here's the other thing. This is from a couple of days ago. Um, black tank top shirts, 79. Oh White my God. tank top shirts. 21. So what's 79 plus 21? 100. I am assuming that there has oh. been one other sale of the tank tops. So in the coming weeks, probably on Friday, after the first hour, sun's out, guns out. Watch out. Watch out, everybody. You could have do that at the upstate studio. I, I do that down here. Oh yeah, Brooklyn. right. <laughs> we'll do it in Brooklyn. Are you kidding? Yeah, sun's out, guns out. It's uh, people are gonna have to wear sunglasses in the studio. 
I, I'm down for that, but it's going to be more than sunglasses. You're 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 going to right. Okay. Uh, I just I hope you're using your native deodorant when you bring your guns out. Of course, of course. Um, but there it is, folks. Challenge met. I I I got to tell you, I don't think I've ever worn a a tank top in my entire life. I, I'll wear the tank top too. I don't care about that. I I just never have. I mean, I'm not. I don't know why. Like, I, I just never have. Um, Are you wearing the tank top from the store? Yeah, I'm gonna okay. wear the. I'll do it too. All right, we got we got. I think two right in the office. Well, um, I just our... want to do it too, so that people can compare how bad you look to how good I'll look in the tank top. Yeah, I'm not sure that that that's gonna be helpful to me, but uh, be that as it may, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a reminder, shop.majorityreportradio.com to get all the merch. We still have, I think, a limited number of the Oh No, It's Sam Cedar, What a Effing Nightmare uh, t-shirt that is um, also for sale there. Uh, baseball shirts also. I should have made it like if we sell 100 baseball shirts, I'll wear one of the baseball shirts. Baseball shirts I feel comfortable with. Tank top, I'm not, I, I don't think I've honestly ever worn a tank top in my entire life. Certainly not. In I mean, other I, than a sketch or something. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, did you guys wear it for Ken, Ken, and Ken? For Ken, Ken, and Ken, I would roll up the sleeves, but it wasn't a full-on tank top. So okay. people have never seen it before. Nobody. I don't think even my family members. Uh, folks, don't forget, your support makes this show possible. You can become a member of jointhemajorityreport.com. And when you do, support the show and you get extra content every single freaking day. Don't forget. Know Me Show, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Check it out at youtube.com slash the No McKee Show. Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian universe? Yeah, on a Wednesday, which is the new night for Left Reckoning, uh, we had Austin Gonzalez of Machete y Mate on to talk about international trips he took to Peru and Venezuela with DSA. So that was a really interesting episode. Uh, Patreon.com slash Left Reckoning. We've got a bonus uh, coming out uh, uh, soon for those people. So if you want to get access to that in the pay post game, so patreon.com slash left reckoning or subscribe to the YouTube. Uh, also we have a, uh, we, I guess we won't introduce them today. We'll, we'll do it next week, but, um, well, we'll talk about that next week. I don't want to go into that right now. Cause we're going to say goodbye to somebody. We're going to say hello to somebody, but maybe, maybe it's too early to do that. Um, Folks, see you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back. 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 Boy is back. And the alpha males are back. 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 Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back. Back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back. 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 Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back. 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 You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a wow! What a fucking nightmare! Nightmare! Bring back DJ Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. You see, white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflakes says what? 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 All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? 
I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Number six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty is the phone number. We got a we got we like this still we got a full well Friday finally we're gonna have like a full on fun half uh today. Um Oh gosh, where should we start? We got a lot of clips today. <clears throat> they're just gone. They're just insane. Let's start with Tucker Carlson's sort of uh, ongoing flirtation, if that you could say that, uh, with um, anti-vaxxers. I mean, this guy is just. It is. Um, I don't know incredible. if it's flirtation anymore. They've gotten to right. you know, second base. Did you play the clip the other day of Jesse Waters and Tucker Carlson? No. Oh, uh, we, you know what? About native lands? Yeah. We should pull that up I, 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 because I want to play that as well. That, that, that clip was just, just the most reprehensible thing. And the thing about this clip, uh, do we have it easy, Brendan? Uh, yeah, a we'll, uh, couple minutes. Okay. All right. Well, let's go with this one first because the other I one have it now. Okay. All right. So let's play this clip just to start this off because I, you know, I, I, I meant to play this the other day, but you know, uh, we got tied up with the libertarian debate and um, this is so reprehensible. It, it is reprehensible in all of the, the, the ways that uh, Fox is, but if you watch it's with Jesse waters, he's also, a, a, you know, a, a horrible, you know, and, and he's like, um, uh, Tucker Carlson is the prototype and Jesse Waters is sort of the poor man's uh, Tucker Carlson. But um, what what's important to watch here is also um, Tucker's face when Waters says this stuff, because you can see that Tucker almost laughs. And he doesn't want to break the idea that like, I mean, the, the, he knows the thing about Tucker Carlson is that's really, really disgusting. And then waters is very similar in this way. They don't, he doesn't care about anything. This guy cares only about putting on a show that he thinks is going to drive a viewership period. End of story. That's it. And you can see him almost laugh at what uh water says but then he tries to you know hold it in not because they're doing a comedy bit i mean i've been in that situation but because he gets a kick out of this and knows that his audience is going to lap it up and he doesn't he is <laughs> the same way that he would go out and promote the iraq war and didn't care at all about it and didn't care and and, and, and it's a game, this like it's mass manipulation of swaths of vulnerable total. people. I don't know what's worse if you actually genuinely believe this. I think he, actually, no, what he does is worse. I, I, that, I mean, that's it. That's it. That is like an age old debate. Right. But right. Um, uh, here it is. Um, and then, of course, what Waters is saying in and of itself is also reprehensible. God, he's like such a so The people who run the country are telling us two things. One, the country's not worth having. It's terrible. And two, Despite being the most powerful people in the country, they're oppressed. How should we interpret this? It well, like first, you. we did not steal this <laughs> pause, land. Pause it for one second. Pause it for one second. Uh, the most powerful people in the I'm, country acting like they're oppressed. It's it's almost like that's projection, Tucker. He's talking about Cory Bush. Yeah. 
and specifically, right? Because she's speaking out. Now, of course, she's not speaking out for just herself. Um, she's speaking out on behalf of her, her constituents. And in many respects, also, uh, you know, re referring to the experience of, of black people, people of color in this country. Um, and, and, and that's the point it, that, that again, in Tucker's world, there is a massive anti-white bias against white people in this country. Go. Like being the most powerful people in the country, they're oppressed. How should we interpret this? Well, first, we did not steal this land. We won this land on the battlefield, and the rest we purchased from the Europeans. So I don't know what Congresswoman Bush wants us to do. Are we supposed to give the Dakotas back to Crazy Horse's family? Are we supposed to give California back to Mexico? As tempting as that sounds, Tucker, it's not a good idea. Then she says blacks aren't free in this country. Blacks are free except from the Democrat Party. And many blacks have said that themselves. Then there's blacks, many blacks. Many right. blacks have said that themselves. Yeah, good. Um, the, the idea that we have won that on the battlefield, um, I, I mean, just- We won it at a microbe level first. And then the emphasis on conquest is really just to obscure the fact that real U.S. Indian relations is about mendacious diplomacy. Like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll maintain this. But like, like, for instance, like the famous Manhattan trade where it's like, oh, they don't know the value of Manhattan. No, that was just a symbolic um, ritual to allow people to pass onto the land, right? Like, right. They didn't have a understanding of property rights in the way that the United States did. Right. And, gen and genocide is just a display of our God-given might, and that's you know completely and, justified. And you, like, just to, he mentions the Sioux. Look at the Sioux in Minnesota, and just the, the the settling of Minnesota, and just the lies and withholding of even the meager promises that we made to those people before we just genocided them out of the Missouri. River Valley and uh, or the Minnesota River Valley and push them into the Dakotas. I mean, like that's that's but that's fundamentally when um, the Daily Wire folks when they emphasize conquest, it's really the history is mendacious diplomacy, it, it, which is not you know like that's even so. In addition to conquest being something that you don't necessarily right. uh, brag about. Yeah, we conquest when we have the military availability to do it. And then when we can't, we sign these treaties. And when we break them, as soon as we can use force to get what we want. And I would also say um, that Waters is on to something. We should give back um, at least the uh, national parks that we, um, we stole uh, from indigenous people. It would actually be... Um, I mean, that makes sense, both in terms of a justice and policy uh, perspective. Uh, but putting that aside and then you can see, you know, Tucker is like desperately trying to maintain his like, oh, I can't believe Waters is doing this. I mean, you know, they're going out and having a drink afterwards and just laughing and laughing about how they um, what they get away with and selling uh, to their uh, their white nationalist base. It, it really is just shockingly it's performance art basically and then i mean at the same time horrible horrible performance art i just I mean, yeah with horrible implications but yes well right if you look at it from like a meta viewpoint uh it's certainly performance art in in terms of um representing representing what fascism looks like or fascist propaganda in real time jesse waters is 43 years old what person that age refers to black people as blacks if they're not doing it just specifically to to appeal someone, to someone someone whose entire intellectual project began under the tutelage of Bill O'Reilly and somebody who's appealing primarily to Bill O'Reilly's age cohort uh, yes. the, the the 70 plus year olds who are falling asleep in front of the TV watching Tucker Carlson and you know getting their their fear fix in before bedtime that's right Got to get an update on the uh, on the race war, and uh, and Tucker's there to give it to you. Meanwhile, for those of you who watch Tucker Carlson not for the race war material, but rather for looking for um, some type of advice on the um, uh, on the pandemic, here's Tucker Carlson. We got two clips of Tucker just to give you a sense of just like how this guy is willing to uh, dance around. Here he is uh, just yesterday talking about um, 
the 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 implications of pushing people to get a covid vaccine and remember there are somewhere between three and a half dozen at least vaccinations that your child must get if you want them to attend public school that we have vaccination requirements across the board um but this is a new one so right here is a uh, Tucker it's evil, Carlson. Right. It's evil. It's more than evil. The federal government spends huge amounts of tax dollars fighting all kinds of diseases, not just COVID. There's cancer, AIDS, tuberculosis, hepatitis, heart disease, diabetes, and many, many more. Each one of these illnesses is its own kind of emergency. Each one kills an awful lot of people. In some cases, kills far more people than COVID has. So does the Biden administration have the right, based on the money they spend fighting these diseases, to your medical information. Do they have right to know your HIV status? Why not? Can HHS force you to take antibiotics for your TB? How about Xanax for your anxiety, Thorazine for your mania? And while we're at it, why are we letting irresponsible, defective people reproduce? Vagrants, mental patients, even QAnon people, all are allowed to have children. Why is that? Why aren't we sterilizing them? Sound crazy? It's happened before on a huge scale. Yes, to uh, black people and uh, indigenous people and uh, people of Latina descent um, and Tucker, if he were alive during those times, it's literally was happening uh, in ICE facilities. He, by the way, he said nothing about that, about forced sterilization of women in migrant detention facilities. Um, and if it, he was around uh, many years ago, he would be incredibly supportive of of that project. Yeah, I mean, the idea that, uh, you know, the slippery slope, if you require vaccinations or I guess, I mean, I don't, I don't even know, like, uh, you know, he's he is um, implying that the, the government is doing something, you know, far more than it's doing in terms of the vaccination, it's simply encouraging people uh, to get vaccinations um, and reporting on the fact that um, people who are dying of covid now uh, are doing so needlessly. And. Um, the primary reason why a lot of people are not getting vaccinated is completely tied into people like Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity and um, Donald Trump. And, and, and every day that goes by now, we're watching the statistics roll in. You have um, more and more people. There is a uh, researchers at Georgetown University pinpoint a number of under-vaccinated clusters of the United States that pose a significant threat to the nations and potentially the world's progress against COVID-19, because that's where we're starting to see massive rates of infection going up. And it's this Delta variant, which, I mean, some of the, some of the numbers on this are just like absolutely insane, right? It's your uh, people with the Delta variant, they found had a hundred a thousand times more copies of the virus in their respiratory tracts than with the original virus and it's just going to keep getting worse and worse it also makes it way more contagious people are contagious earlier on after being infected when they have the delta variant and it's going to continue to metastasize and new variants are going to come to the fore what the longer people don't get vaccinated that is just the reality of the matter and i Tucker is as complicit as anybody in the the continuation of that project, or the most, in fact, probably. But let's look, go back to um, early uh, 2021. And you can see the evolution of Tucker on uh, the vaccine, que vaccine question. Now, the issue is for Tucker that um, this idea of, you know, encouraging people to get vaccines it could ultimately lead to eugenics. Uh, back then, it was like, hey, wait a second. Why aren't white people getting it first? Racial and ethnic minority groups are disproportionately represented in many essential industries, end quote. In other words, it's entirely racial. They're making the decision based on race. Kathleen Dooling's presentation concluded industries. that doling out life-saving medicine on the right. basis of skin color would, quote, mitigate health inequities. Of course, it would kill people, and she effectively concedes that. But the people it would kill come from a disfavored race, so it's not a big deal. It's been a very long time since anyone close to what we would consider the mainstream has endorsed eugenics. And that's exactly what that is. It's eugenics. 
So to be clear, eugenics is when you encourage people to get uh, vaccines and eugenics is when you um, prioritize other people to get vaccines. So it's both yeah. it's eugenics, no matter what heads, it's eugenics tails. It's eugenics. And he just was just a second that he was just laughing off the history of the United States and our conquest, which involved uh, varieties of eugenics and genocide for <laughs> non white people. So I mean, he, he just wants to fear monger and use the word eugenics without obviously connecting it to any context. But yeah, the yeah. lesson he wants to make any facts um, sort of go towards is that liberals are attacking white people. <laughs> There you go. Exactly. And you give me any set of facts, says Tucker. It's the Tucker Tar Carlson challenge. Be presented with any type of facts and not conclude that this is a, a democratic white race war. Oh, come on, though. He's just an anti-war voice and somebody who we can connect with on the left, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, All roads lead to white genocide. Speaking of uh, other networks, basically um, uh, shoveling out their own sort of propaganda garbage. Here is uh, Nicole Wallace with a very interesting perspective on um, uh, people's uh, scrutiny or questioning of the U.S. intelligence agencies. Remember, she worked in the George W. Bush administration. And on uh, the McCain campaign. And on the McCain campaign. Um, this is, uh, uh, people may not recall this, but there was a, a lot of different spying <laughs> by, uh, us intelligence agencies, a lot of different controversies over their spying. Um, in fact, people may not remember this too, because this goes all the way back 40 years ago, 30, 50 years ago, um, where we had something called Cointel Pro, which was also a little bit of a problem in terms of spying. Uh, but here is Nicole Wallace. I believe his outreach to Russian intermediaries could have been the basis for NSA surveillance. While many questions still remain, what is clear is that Carlson's dangerous accusations have added to a growing chorus of distrust in our country's intelligence agencies, all started during the presidential transition by the disgraced ex-president. <laughs> Joining yeah, our yeah. conversation, Frank Figluzzi, former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI, now the host of the Bureau podcast, and an MSNBC national security analyst, and Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel, a former senior member of the Mueller investigation, now an NYU law professor, and lucky for us, MSNBC legal analyst. Frank Figluzzi, talk about who the NSA listens to, and say if I wanted to interview I don't know if I had wanted to interview Ahmadinejad or or Vladimir Putin myself, what would that sort of expose me to in terms of anyone potentially hearing those efforts? Yeah, the, the NSA is perhaps the most secretive uh, agency. Well, there you go. I mean, uh, the, the idea that, I mean, um, First off, I'm not surprised that uh, the NSA may be monitoring uh, Putin or people around Putin um, and uh, people calling in get uh, swept up into that dragnet. I mean, That's not America terribly America spies surprising. on our allies. Like, we've been right, busted for this course. regularly. Right. And it would be consistent with, you know, uh, a Trump, uh, you know, Trump appointee maybe in that chain of uh, command to go and say to Tucker Carlson, they have your um, your correspondence with the, uh, you know, Putin people uh, to try and get uh, an interview. It's conceivable. The real question would be, are they um, soaking up, you know, other stuff of Tucker Carlson's? Who knows? But the idea that um, distrust of the the intelligence agencies um, is a function of Donald Trump is just uh, is it is in a way to essentially say that the distrust that we should have for intelligence agencies because of their enormous record of abuse in this country that dates back since the advent of intelligence agencies um, is somehow a function of Donald Trump. I mean, this is well for her. I mean, for her specific project on MSNBC, that's exactly what it needs to be, right? Um, 
everything that results in distrust of government is because of Donald Trump. Government functioned perfectly fine before right. Donald Trump. Our intelligence agencies, when they were indiscriminately mass spying on people uh, under the Obama administration, she largely has no problem with that, I mean, or definitely has no problem with that. Um, so the, the project of what she's trying to put out there is that uh, actually mistrust in our institutions is really, really bad. And that's probably the worst thing that Donald Trump did to this country. Yeah, I feel right. like that whole thing where it's like 17 different intelligence agencies say Donald Trump did this thing with Russia. I think there's a lot of people like Nicole Wallace who were expecting that to have a decisive uh, 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 sway in the election and nobody cared. I think maybe that's what she's referring to. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the idea, as Brendan was just pointing out the, uh, in, our in our little chat here, that uh, somebody who worked for the George W. Bush administration is going to <laughs> pretend as if there is no reason to be mistrustful in intelligence agencies. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's what she's convinced herself, though, because that's the only way that I think one can sleep at night at being a part of that. Those are her peeps. Yeah. Let's go to the phones, call them from an 857 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 857. 857. Going once. Try it. Blowing again. it. Call them from wait, uh, 514 area code. Who's this? Is it me? Uh, I think it is you. Who is you? Hi, Sam. Uh, my name is Ludmi. Your name is what? I've been a long time listening. Ludmi. Oh, wait. I can't tell what the first letter is. My name is Ludmi. L O U. L O U. Ludmi. Okay. Yeah. You yeah, sound yeah, a little yeah. bit, it's hard. It's a little bit hard to hear you. Is it better now? Yeah. Just try and get a little closer to the phone. I'm trying to the phone. Okay. So I'm calling you from Montreal. Um, well, from, that explains uh, it. I'm Haitian. And I wanted to talk about. Um, What's happening in Haiti a little bit? Okay. Yes, and so sorry for your Stanley Cup loss. I don't know if course. you saw the Washington. Okay, I don't know if you saw the Washington Post uh, article, the editorial board, I where did. they asked for the U.S. to intervene in Haiti. Okay. Mm -hmm. That doesn't surprise me. I just wanted to know. Yeah, and I just wanted to know what do you think about that. I mean, I think that the UN is going to end up being a surrogate for uh, the United States interests there. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I to be honest with you, after uh, talking to uh, Pascal, uh, I, I don't really have a sense of what the, you know, the, the best, uh, the, the best situation would be. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm, the, the reason um, I think it was like uh, worth bringing up is the fact that the U.S. is already in Haiti. They've been there in 24, from 24 until 2019, and they left a lot of troops and a lot of I'm like, sorry, uh, I'm like having it. trouble hearing what you're saying for whatever reason. Oh, shit. Oh. Wait. There you go. That's better. I'm just saying like the U.S. The U.S. never left Haiti. That's what I'm that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, you're saying the U.S. never... The U.N. Never, the U.S. and the U.N. never left Haiti. They've been there since 2014. They've been there since... 20... So that's why I don't understand. Since 24, not 2014, sorry. 24. Since um, 04. Since 04, okay. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I don't understand why they are asking for, for them to be there. Oh, uh, they're probably is, asking... Is they're, the yes, I think they're asking for expanded authority probably to, you know, administer or observe the elections or maybe they're, you know, uh, there with just an expanded mandate, right? I mean, that's that's usually what it is. It's not just a question of actual physical presence. It's a question of, like, what permissions do they decide to provide for you know, uh, troops or advisors or whomever that is there. So appreciate Yeah, the but they, they created the solution. Anyway, oh, okay. I'm going to hang up. Okay, okay. Bye, bye bye. Call from a 561 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is me. It is you. Where are you calling from? Hi. How are you doing, Sam Cedar? Good. How are you? This is, uh, my name is Ellis Pemlack. Uh, I want to say hi to Emma as well. Wait, what's your name? Um, Ellis. Ellis, okay. And where are you calling from, Ellis? 
I'm calling from Delray Beach, Florida. Delray Beach, okay. What's on your mind? So my question is about um, Biden's State of the Union and his infrastructure bill. Okay. When I watched the uh, the state, sorry. Go ahead. When I watched his uh, his State of the Union, uh, he's talking about universal child care. Yeah. I was wondering if that was still in the infrastructure bill. I, we don't know. I mean, it it it, it there are there were two tranches tranches to the Biden infrastructure bill, right? Um, as he rolled them out. And we just don't know what is because now that 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 framework uh, is is different now, because now we have a bipartisan bill that deals with the more sort of like bricks and mortar style infrastructure. And then we have uh, the House and the Senate coming up with a bill and Sanders is trying to push for a six trillion dollar bill and others are trying to push for a two or three trillion dollar bill. So we just don't know what's in it yet mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that we've seen any indication yet is uh for in terms of like what's in and what's out it there's all the indications and we're going to play this clip uh maybe from uh addy bark and, and uh nancy pelosi that um medicare ex um dropping the medicare age is out but expanding the nature of medicare coverage is in uh so that it would mm -hmm. cover dental and vision so but beyond okay. that you know what your guess is as good as anybody's right now we'll have a better sense of that in a week or two all right because i think that that's such an amazing thing for america and it's a very progressive thought to have child care for people who are you know in low income families without a doubt without so a doubt look the bottom line is if there is a four trillion dollar five trillion dollar bill that comes out of the house and the senate as part of reconciliation in addition to the nearly trillion dollar bill that the bipartisan uh you know group is going to come out with this is going to be there's going to be stuff in there that's going to be amazing for americans i mean really amazing uh we just don't know yet if if those numbers are mm -hmm. going to hold but appreciate the call uh, uh, i just want to ask a quick, quick question uh, i'm 22 i just graduated with uh associates what do you think of a good field of study would be if i'm interested in politics uh Please, uh, polit I'm a politics. Guy, so I would say uh, government. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, what you know, like, like, um, uh, I, it, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, pol politics, <laughs> government, yeah, poli sci, I guess. History too. History, right. history also very helpful. Thank you, Sam. See you. You're amazing. Oh well, thank you. You're uh, pretty good yourself, Ellis. Uh, let's take um, one more call here for the time being. Calling from a 615 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Is this me? Yes, it is you. Who's this? Where are you calling from? I am Alacrity from Alabama, and I shall be swift. Alacrity I... from Alabama. Swift, swift yes. Alacrity. Okay. Yes. So I watched your Yaron versus your own Peter debate. I watched. And I just wanted to ask you a point. Of, can you hear me? Yes, it's Yaron, I believe, is how you pronounce his name. Oh, forgive me. Anyway, I watched the debate, and there was this one point that there were several points, but the one that stood out to me the most, one was when you were addressing slavery with him, and you mentioned how you had interviewed several authors about <clears throat> slavery, about how it was largely responsible for the economic mm -hmm. boons experienced by various countries around the world developing developed what are now developed countries that were developing then from slavery and the tr and the slave triangle like matt said so i just wanted to say that i think that that is a bit i don't know who the authors you spoke to were but i think that that is a bit of an oversimplification given the fact that slavery while yes it can be used to generate capital formation it does have several detrimental effects technologically and industrially in fact <clears throat> It's the abundance of slave labor that can actually inhibit technological advancement. And uh, I have empirical evidence for this. Would you like me to detail it? I have no. some data. I mean, the idea that if I have free labor, an endless supply of free labor uh, to pick cotton, 
So I don't now have to uh, develop a uh, mechanized cotton picker. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't seem terribly profound to me. Well, I see, but what is the point then when you say that slavery is used, is that slavery was a driving force of industrialization, economic growth, then when you say this that? This entire because project, here's what I would say, like, <laughs> like tobacco in Virginia would not have been possible without slavery, without plantation slavery. Like, so whether it had later effects on depressing industrial development or whatever, it's just not, it, would just, it just, it gave you the chance to do it. That's where those profits came from. Those profits were not possible without slavery. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'm not even sure what the point of saying like, well, on day one, because slavery is involved there, that, I mean, if your argument is, hey, um, these folks were uh, idiots because they just they went for the low hanging fruit of of enslaving people and getting free labor. And that's the way that they uh, created the economic engine. They probably they could have probably made 15 to 20 percent more had they waited a couple of years for somebody to invent a, um, you know, a cotton picker. But they invented uh, but, with the profits they got from slavery. Of, co of <laughs> like, course, of course. And let's be clear here, like. The option of a plantation owner to, um, uh, you know, go and buy slaves or wait until someone invents a, uh, a machine that picks cotton. Like, I don't even understand what is, I mean, do I think that the existence of free labor that is far more accessible to everybody than machines that hypothetically might exist in the future, were there not free labor? Do, I'm not even sure of, like, aside from that not being terribly profound, what is the point of that? What does that have to do with the argument that we had with your own? Well, a few things earlier, as you said earlier, that if my argument is that, well, they just should have waited for more adventures. No, I must say that, that is a mischaracterization. As how it relates back to your own, I, I'm not even sure what your point was in bringing it up in the first place. I didn't bring that. up. I didn't Second bring all, up. I, uh, I didn't bring up uh, slavery. Uh, he did. He see, said it was really easy to see whose fruits, whose fruits of the labor is are. It's easy to attribute, yeah, like ownership, and it's definitely not the history right. of this entire continent. Is that that is not the case? Exactly. And it wasn't I just know like like the white people were brought over here in bondage to serve on those in those places too, mainly to balance out the black demography. Well, first of all, Mr. Cedar, I wanted to mention that if you. I, again, as I say, I was addressing specifically when you defended it after your your own had got done saying his bit. You then came in and said, with the author, well, that you had interviewed like half a dozen authors, authors and you had said that, that was the case. But the Dude, thing is, is that you're not actually, even refuting my um, point. You're simply saying that no, they could I'm have not, made I'm, more I'm, if they didn't uh, use slavery. That's a hypothetical that could be possible. But the point is, well, no, they did get slaves and it did drive uh the the free labor did drive the development of a cotton industry or in the case of virginia a tobacco industry it did provide opportunities for bankers in the north uh to finance and and, yeah. and export early ports in the north were like servicing those ships that's what like get some turpentine from like boston right like that's that's what those ports were important for because the real money wasn't getting slaves to the caribbean and sugar and rum out of there yes i mean uh, like you know like i don't know uh, the idea that um, I, if I start a YouTube channel and I get a bunch of, of views and I monetize it, um, well, that may be the case, but you haven't optimized it. Well, okay, so there's room for me to make 20% more. I mean, even if I stipulate what you're talking about, uh, which I will for the sake of argument, because I, I find it a completely irrelevant argument, what, what is your point? My point is that you grossly overstated the role that it played. For example, some studies say it's only responsible for about 5 to 13 percent of the capital formation. In fact, the, the role of slavery is even more detrimental to I'm sorry, you look at these stats, but how about looking at history? Like any of these colonies, dude, you look at the formation of these colonies and who's building the stuff, who's chopping the trees down? I, Mr. Cedar. Uh, I was not unable to hear what Matt, I believe that's Matt. I don't know who that was. Matt is saying that you are not accounting. You're looking at hypotheticals about. No, I wasn't finished yet. Excuse Peter. me. I was not. I'm going to explain to you what he was saying. 
you're looking well, at look hypotheticals that are telling you that there could have been a uh, a greater return if they didn't use slaves and they they uh, developed um, you know uh, a technology, and Matt is telling you look at history, look at the way that um, that the people organize themselves, look at where the uh, the sources of 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 revenue and economic activity were happening. And you can see that they would import a bunch of slaves. Now, maybe they weren't doing it efficiently enough, and maybe I overstated the percentage in which people, but the absence of technology because uh, slavery may have an inhibited technology's growth doesn't in any way contradict the notion that the economy and, and that slavery drove all this economic activity. Yes, it does, because if it's only responsible for about 5 to 13 percent of capital formation, you aren't accounting for the other factors. For example, if you look at the begin the roots of the Industrial Revolution, so you, and you actually find that there is an incentive for industrialization where wages were higher. For example, in Okay, Britain, wait a second. Listen, 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 wait, listen, I, listen. No, no, wait. I, here's why I'm interrupting you. I don't care. No, I don't care. Why, uh, I mean, even if you are 100 percent right, let me stipulate. You're hundred percent right. I grossly overstated the amount that slavery, it was just more of like a, there was no economic incentive for anybody to maintain slaves. It was more of just like a hobby. They were doing it for hobby. fun. They hated black people it was that a, much. It was a hobby and it was just out and out racism. What's your point? I've stipulated point your is, point. My point is that when you talk about slavery in relation to capitalism, often as in the context you're referring to it, you're you're drawing implications from it, economic implications from it, that are simply flawed when you overstate the amount is all that I'm saying. For example, as I was saying, if you look at the roots of the Industrial okay. Revolution... Okay, let me tell you something. Numbers numbers I don't care. Bro. That I, I don't. I honestly don't care. I will stipulate well, why that I am... That, 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 that slavery, tax. according... Because there's two opinions about slavery. One is that it, drived, uh, it drove economic activity. And the other opinion is yours, that it's just about um, specifically wanting to imprison uh, people from Africa and get their free labor because it was more of like a hobby or maybe it was a status symbol or something like that. German Either culture. way, it doesn't really, I mean, I guess in your mind, it, it, it protects criticism of capitalism uh, uh, and a critique of capitalism. But uh, then I would say, like, well, people were accumulating too much money if that's what their hobby was. I would say that we need well, to have confiscatory taxation so that we cannot develop such hobbies that would lead to the brutalization and the enslavement. Mo of most hobbies millions. don't. Most hobbies are like collecting baseball cards. It doesn't necessarily. Well, I guess they do accumulate in, or you know, playing fantasy football it doesn't mean that you're uh, accumulating wealth and enslaving people. Well, Mr. What you stated, my opinion was that people just did it as a hobby. No, that's a gross mischaracterization. People, that's there is true, plenty yeah. of room for irrational in economic behavior. But the point is, they were very that, irrationally look, economically <laughs> behaved. I mean, I'm look, sorry. dude, go read about the Industrial Revolution. Go read about like what drove. I, I, go look at the Biden. numbers of slaves that are imported as the ability for technology to weave the cotton, to uh, ship is, the cotton. That is not the only thing that I'm stating. If, as I'm trying to state, slavery existed almost everywhere in world history. It existed for thousands of years. So slavery was not the driving factor. But if you look at places where the Industrial Revolution occurred, and you look at wage rates, for example, for example, in Britain before the Industrial right, dude, Revolution, dude, you know what? Honestly, I, you're I, this, like, 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 this is I'm the sorry. most masturbatory conversation I could imagine. It has nothing to do with the conversation I had with your own. It has nothing to do with anything. I don't understand Fine. what your point is. Tell me your point. Plain, but I keep getting interrupted, Mr. Cedar. Oh. Anyway, as I was saying, slavery existed everywhere in the world and existed for thousands of years. So you need to look at what makes places different if you want to see where new, if you want to understand the causes for new events like the Industrial Revolution. And there's empirical the evidence that high wage, which existed in Britain, for example, in Britain, wages per day for workers were about 11 grams of silver per day, where in India or China, they're oh, only about Jesus. three or four grams. What is so the point? No. All right. I'm sorry. You've been on the phone for 11 minutes. And if you haven't said your point by then, uh, then it's just going to be a waste of time. 
and it's not because I was talking over you. It's because you're coming in and telling me that I had a gross miscalculation of the value of slavery to the economics of this country. Now, and I even stipulated that so that you could make your point. And if that's the only point, then okay, that's your argument. This is what happens when you read econ to the exclusion of history. Facts don't care about uh, your uh, your feelings, Matt. Like, go tell w uh, William Byrd II, owner of 200 slaves in Virginia, that, hey, actually, you could do this more profitably if you just hire white people. No, that wouldn't have worked. They would have, like, this is about control. Race is a, as a, basically a technology for those people to exploit people um, based on the color of their skin. And they brought black people over so, because they were sla enslaving Native Americans. But guess what? They escape. And you have a tr problem with enslaving white people because you have <laughs> the people from your home countries that have issues with that. So you enslave black people because that's where the profit for tobacco is. Yeah. And his point, his, the point he's trying to make is that industrialization was happening at a greater rate and making more money, therefore, what slavery was like an artifact, basically, and not like a relevant driver of like American in growth in terms of economic yeah, might. Yeah. The major input, like, like we think about these things, like that libertarians like think they're like they know econ 100. They need to know econ 400, where you don't look at these things isolated from, uh, like the British economy is uh, separate from the American one. No, where do you think like what? Where do you think that cotton is going? What were some America? of those? Stop it, globalists. What was the name of those books? Uh, we had, we interviewed a couple of years ago. Like there was like three or four books on this that I I invite that um, that libertarian to read. King Cotton was one of them. I can't remember what the other two. Yeah, Sven uh, Beckert's Slavery's Capitalism was like a, a few writers contributed to that one. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, but even if I, even if I concede the point, which I, I don't, but for the sake of argument, I stipulate that, yes, everybody who owned slaves was irrational. And it was just, there was no, it was a drag on the economy to have all that free labor. So what? What, what's the point that i mean that, that there's working no backwards from your conclusion that capitalism is an unfettered capitalism is and therefore capitalism go. is good yeah yeah it's not because because free labor if free labor is not beneficial to uh the capitalist then why should a 15 dollars minimum wage be a problem why should why shouldn't why 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 not just Pay your labor whatever they want. Yeah. Why do we have a system that constrains wages? It's it's denial of really horrid history too. That's I mean, the think of what Pascal's talking about, like about the Haitians where they're brought over at eighteen to die at twenty five, because like that's those actuarial tables getting developed for capitalism. Uh, how much peak labor can we get out of this guy before he kicks it, and we need to bring over another boatload, which like maybe fifty will die on the way over, and we'll get a hundred, but that's still good labor for another five years. That's the way that they were thinking back then. Yep. And if it is the case that no wages, um inhibits technology then maybe low wages does too so maybe the argument we should be promoting for a 15 dollars minimum wage frankly for a 25 dollars minimum wage is that we're going to see the increase in the value of technology i mean but also the, the that also reveals another aspect of a libertarian mind view uh mindset i say i would say is that they're talking about economic principles as if we're not talking about human beings like that there is no relationship between, uh, you know, the, the economy is something that exists in nature. And like in the same way that like we need to like take care of the climate and that has an overriding, um, you know, uh, uh, immediacy to, you know, sort of like the desires of, uh, of, of people to, I don't know, burn fossil fuel or whatnot. Um, there is this notion that the economy is not a series of decisions that we make, but rather some uh, thing of uh, some force of nature that exists outside of human beings. And there should be no relationship between uh, human suffering and um, the, you know, w what we perceive to be a healthy economy. It's just bizarre. I thank him for uh, calling in about that topic though. <laughs> 
Edward Baptiste, we also interviewed, right? Yeah. And that's the says a man gave name to all the animals. That's half the the half that's never been told. Uh, we have interviewed the author about it. One more phone call. Call from an eight four seven area code. We'll take more calls. We'll take yeah. one more for right now. Eight four seven. Who's this? Where are you calling? Oh, hello, hello, Sam. Samuel Cedar, uh, I hear your ego has been stroked. Mr. Cedar to, to you. Is this <laughs> Josh from Chicago. It's Mr. Cedar. I'm getting used to that. Mr. Mr. I thought it was Samuel Lincoln Cedar. Well, Mr. Samuel Lincoln Cedar is fine. Mr. Cedar is fine. Just don't get too familiar. Um, oh, okay. 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 We'll keep it distant. I'll keep it distant. Um, well, um, uh, first of all, Emma, I actually think I may have seen you on the street like a month ago now in Crown Heights. But I it's called your name, but Ms. Vigland fashion. to you. Yes. It's well, no, actually, I you I prefer. It's quite frightening. Wait, where did you think you saw me? Quite frightening. Crown Heights. Maybe. Maybe. Well, maybe. You know. But um, I mean, if you call my name and I heard it was Josh from Chicago, I probably just moved on with my life. <laughs> Oh, uh, you mean like the bear? Like a all right. Well, let's. Uh, uh, I didn't hear. I didn't. I didn't hear you, Josh. God, God so ice cold. cold. If it was uh, me, anyways, if it was uh, me, I didn't hear you. Um. Anyways, I, I just wanted to say because uh, I know like a lot of people have been down on sort of the elections. Um, in in New York, and I think Eric Adams sucks. I voted begrudgingly for Maya Wiley and Catherine Garcia at number two, even though I'm not a fan of hers. Uh, but there are actually some really good city council elections that I don't think have been covered, some that weren't in DSA. Um, and uh, I just wanted to point out that, like, uh, for example, in my district, Sandy Nurse, who is a literal communist, won with, I think, by the final ranked choice tabulation, 67% of the vote, or somewhere around there, uh, and that's District 37. And uh, Dharma Diaz is like a literal landlord um, and like just uh, basically, basically has been uh, doing the bidding for like landlords and, uh, you know, the real estate developers in my district. And so I think it's great to have someone that left wing representing me, but also like Kristen, um, Kristen Richardson Johnson, I think her name is, or Jordan, I, I might have the, the last name correctly, but she won in Harlem. So I think there were a, pretty, a lot of good like left results, even if DSA didn't have like a, a great night. And even Shahana, who beat Brandon, who's a friend of mine, she's still a socialist and she's a DSA member and is going to be much the left of Brad Lander who had that seat. Um, plus Brad got elected comptroller as well. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I know people have been down, but I thought, I don't know what your thought on this, but I thought it was like an okay night for the left. Um, I, I, you know, I have got literally on my desk a piece um, by uh, in Jacobin, um, how the DSA Ross, won and Ross lost. Peter. Yeah, and I, I and I, I, I plan wow. on getting to that, but I have, I have yet to. Wow. I mean, I think Ross is kind of dismissive of. I like Ross um, personally. I think he's a bit. I think he focuses too much on what DSA did and there's a lot of the left outside of DSA. Right. That I think is important to think about. Um, and I think in terms of that, there were just like a lot of women of color did really well. And we ran two candidates against women of color. Um, even they had to happen to be black men. And I think like people rallied around them this year, like a lot of organizations endorsed them. Um, not, and I, you know, a, a lot of these people are good. Like Shahana is very good. Crystal, so she says, has some very progressive campaign promises. I really hope she keeps them. Uh, I preferred Mike in that district, but uh, Mike Hollingsworth. But I think, um, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think the, the city council is to the left based on, you know, the incumbents that have been taken out, but also like just in general, like there have been some, you know, Tiffany's on there. Tiffany yeah. won her election, Tiffany Caban. And so I think, like, um, I mean, the big bummer for me was Justine Kaur not winning, uh, just because uh, she was like a real. It was a very um, stretched district for DSA to run in. Um, it was very suburban, um, not a lot of tenants, um, and she also just had an amazing platform. Um, but I think, like, 
um, it's not terrible. And with redistricting in two years, a lot of these people are going to be primary, right. which is something else to think about. Um, so, all right. Um, well, uh, I'm going to dig know. more into it, um, but uh, I, I I don't have the to be honest, like I just am not aware of a significant number of the people we're running for city council um, in New York. But Josh from Chicago. Yeah, appreciate it, Josh. Was just messing with you. You know that. I don't think it was me, though. I'm not messing with you about the Giants, but, you know. Well, we have, you know, we have a real rivalry (laughs) going next season, Josh, with that first round pick. All right, we'll, we'll play some kind of bet. We'll play some kind of bet. All right, Josh, have a good weekend. Thanks for the call, buddy. I want to talk about this Texas law. You don't want to talk about the Bears? The Bears? No. I don't care about the Bears. I really don't. I know. I know. No one really does. It's Pats. It's all Pats. Um, I've worn, I think, as Ken, Ken, and Ken, one of the uh, Bury the Bears shirts that (laughs) I the 45 of them that I you told up. me that you pr- like the the what, what super bowl was that the pats loss oh, they lost it that was that was then in the 86 i have no idea it was 1986 mm. and um I, the 86 bears you like when they get brought up all the time i don't uh right. because i you know my buddy uh was at tulane at the time they, i know that the super bowl was down in new orleans He's like, let's buy a bunch of Bury the Bears t-shirts and we'll make a ton of money. And somehow I thought, I'm going to sell it. This just gives you a sense of my business acumen. I'm going to sell them after the Super Bowl and I could probably get 10% more because the Patriots are going to win. I, 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 I'm trying to like remember back, like, was I just lazy or did I actually genuinely believe that? You're just ahead of your time in terms of the Patriots winning. I knew. I mean, if I had those 40 now, I could sell them. Yeah. Never faced So New York Times reporting on a Texas law which has passed. I'm quite sure. um, I mean, Abbott has signed this law, and I don't know when it's supposed to go into effect. Um. It bans abortions after about six weeks of pregnancy when there is a fetal heartbeat. It contains what the Times refers to as a legal innovation that could um, have impact far outside of this law and uh, Texas. It, um, It prohibits official state officials from enforcing it instead it um it deputizes essentially citizens by saying that um citizens can um can sue people who have had abortions now what's difficult about this law is in the past, um, clinics would challenge the law's constitutional constitutionality, and so they would sue government officials who they knew were gearing up to close them down, you know, or prevent them from performing uh, abortions. Well, now those clinics can't sue anybody because they don't know who it is that they would be suing. So this ca- this law, which is supposed to come into effect in September, cannot be challenged before it's actually rolled out. Um, So you can't challenge it, A. Now, this is, I I mean, I don't know what they would sue. Like, I don't know. What harm could you, I mean, I'd like to sue you, Sam, uh, for you getting a colonoscopy. Right. I mean. (laughs) Like, I don't understand. I I don't understand. Because it's offensive to me. But even if there is a law there, um, it is, I don't know how you pursue civil litigation based upon that law. If you cannot prove any damages um, that you could get compensated for or that you, or or harm. I mean, those are the two things you need for that tort uh, case. And according to a law professor at New York University, uh, 
She said, quote, for this piece, if a barista at the Starbucks overhears you talking about your abortion and it was performed after six weeks, that barista is authorized to sue the clinic where you obtained the abortion and to sue any other person who helped you, like the Uber driver who took you there. Now, this is completely unprecedented. They're in California, they talk about a consumer protection law, which gives anyone in the state the right to sue a company for disseminating false information or engaging in other unfair business practices without necessarily um, proving that you've been harmed. But that is in support of state enforcement, not in lieu of it. So that the, you know, constitutionality of that case can be tested. Last week, last month, I guess it was, the Supreme Court ruled in that Equifax case that there's a statute that says Equifax and the other, um, the other, cons the other credit reporting bureaus cannot compile information that um, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was that 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 um, puts you on uh, or uh, some type of like list that has you, I think, associated with with criminal activity or something like that. Um, it, it to do it to do it um, uh, in, in a way that in any way prevents you wrongly prevents you from getting um, from getting a, a, you know a type of loan or whatnot. And a guy sued. His name was Rodriguez. His name was on the list uh, mistakenly. There was about, um, or shouldn't have been on the list at all. There was about 8,000 people on that list. He sued as part of a class action in support of all the 8,000 on that list. And the Supreme Court said, you cannot sue, not uh, even though the law says you can't be put on that list, you cannot sue until that list is used to inhibit your ability to get a loan. So you actually have to wait until you get rejected from a loan, then you sue Equifax. Right. But that may prevent you from getting a car for two years. That may prevent you from buying a house for two years. That may prevent you from, I don't know, going to college for two years or whatever it is. Um, it's an absurd ruling, but it's hard to see how you can sue until there's actual harm done, even if there's a statute that says this is wrong. And but all it even... takes is some Texas judge, Sam. I mean, well, all that's it the other thing is that that's what's going to complicate this because these are state laws. Right. And if there's no constitutionality because it's supposedly just a civil thing, it's going to be interesting to see how this goes about with state law. So it's, but it's a, an innovation that we should keep our eye on because um, it could be horrific a uh, way of, you know, this is all just about intimidating, right? Mm -hmm. And and just sort of not challenging the right, just making the right completely inaccessible. And it's just a new route too, right? And, and yes. they've been, they've been state legislatures across the country have been engaging in creating laws they know won't stand under row, but they're going to appeal and they're going to appeal and they're going to appeal. And they've got their best shot in decades because we've got Amy Coney Barrett, who is flirting with this at the it's very least. Yeah, right. It's and that too. But we should also be clear that what the strategy has been is not just to, um, is to keep passing laws that don't necessarily frontally take on the right that a woman has to abortion but begin to make it in practical terms impossible in certain areas, right? So we have, you know, so-called trap laws that are now okay, more or less with the uh, Supreme Court. You know, uh, if you get an abortion, it has to be in a building that has a 24 foot ceiling. Oh, you, you don't have a clinic that has a 24 foot ceiling? You can't have abortions. I mean, you make it difficult enough so that you the, the practical implication is that a, a, an abortion is more or less uh, made so onerous in terms of regulation that it's that it's essentially illegal at that point. It doesn't really exist. Um, and that's 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 the um, that's the name of the game. Um, all right, let's go to uh, oh wait, what else? Do we have some uh, sound that we should do here too? Let's see. 
Um, oh, yeah, let's play his Clyburn clip. Oh, no, no, no. Actually, let's play the um, Pelosi. Pelosi clip. Mm -hmm. So uh, Addie Barkin, the um, uh, Medicare for All activist, interviewed um, Nancy Pelosi. It was done for, um, what is it? If What's the name of that? Uh, now This. Now This. So the, uh, so the interview is a little bit choppy. He, there are two things that are on the table right now in terms of Medicare for all, or Medicare, I should say. One has been dropping the age of eligibility to 60, 55. Biden was in favor of dropping it to 60. Maybe you could do a buy-in at 55. The idea is to get as many people on board in that program as possible. And Bernie's backing this in the Senate, um, but not enough Democrats as of now. And and reports were uh, a couple of weeks ago that like there was just not the support for that. And instead, they were focusing on expanding benefits for uh, Medicare, current Medicare recipient. So dental, vision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here is an exchange which I think um, a both confirms that reporting that that's what they're planning to do and b shows the absolute bs behind that decision separately from strengthening medicare president biden campaigned on a promise to lower the medicare eligibility age to 60 which would cover another 23 million people this expansion could be paid for easily in different ways. One of the options would be to empower Medicare to negotiate drug prices just as the Department of Veterans Affairs does, which pays half as much for drugs as Medicare. I know that you pride yourself on representing your caucus, especially when there is broad consensus like this. So, will you also bring forward the bill to lower the Medicare eligibility age? Well, the money that you discussed about giving the secretary the uh, ability to negotiate is the money that we were spending on hearing, vision, and dental. Now, should there be more money, then we can take it to the next step. But the president is looking at the budget to see how that is. We have $400 billion uh, for home care for our seniors, for people with disabilities, a very top priority for us that we want to protect. If we're using the money for renegotiating prices for expanded benefits, let's get as much money out of that as possible. The way we're writing the laws, pharmaceutical companies cannot increase the price of prescription drugs higher than inflation. If they do, they have to give a rebate to the federal government of that amount of money. Well, she gave away the game there, right? So if the key phrase is, if we're using the money for the money, she is focusing on a finite amount of money that they've already decided that they're going to stick with and not expand when it comes to addressing Medicare. And instead of lowering the eligibility age, they're going to attempt to, and this is not even a guarantee that they do this, encompass dental vision and hearing which is really important for seniors of course but they could do both she's creating a false choice to bark in there and i mean it's a false choice that allows democrats to weasel away in this conversation right and it's all under this sort of rubric of a uh, pay for and pay go and this yep. and that and and it's not just a pay for right it's that medicare itself has to pay for the enhanced uh benefits Medicare savings, I should say, has to pay for uh, the uh, the enhanced benefits as opposed to any new money. And I think that's the, you know, at the end of the day, expanding it to more people is um, obviously better for those of us who want Medicare for all. Because the more people you get in the boat, the easier it is going to be to improve the seating on the boat, as it were. And um, and this is just an example of the relentless agenda that Nancy Pelosi has to deny any growth in the popularity or the utility of Medicare. Whether it's Medicare for all or Medicare for more, uh, she desperately doesn't want that. And we know this. 
And we knew we this in this the pandemic her, response. Her, yeah. Even before that, her chief of staff has been out there, um, uh, you know, um, uh, slagging Medicare for all. We know this. Nancy Pelosi is an obstacle to more people getting Medicare. She's an obstacle to 60 year olds being eligible. She's an obstacle to 55 year olds. She's an obstacle to uh, 25 year olds getting it, to people being able to buy into it or for all people getting it. She is um, a huge obstacle here. Now, I don't know if she was in favor of it. Would you necessarily see everyone snap in line? But probably. Oh, I mean, it uh, what do you mean? Much easier. She doesn't, she doesn't, her and Chuck Schumer, unlike Mitch McConnell, who will whip the hell out of his caucus, they do not feel they have the ability to, which is right or wrong, whip their caucus into standing together. That's why Schumer is just letting. Well, they are. Well. By denying it, right? I mean, I, they're, you know, like the 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 democratic caucus is not the same as republicans i mean that's why republicans are able to nationalize their elections much easier they just they have a you know more or less they're all one, pro one corporate demo. extremists yeah they're, right yes i mean they have one demo one um a, there's a lot more um consistency in the republican position than certainly on the democratic right there's like all roads lead to deregulation and tax cuts and then it's just right. it's much easier to do that than in the Democratic Party, maybe a third, maybe a half of those roads lead there. And maybe there's, uh, you know, a third or a half uh, where they're at head in the opposite direction. And maybe there's a third or, half, you know, the third in there that's like, oh, whatever I got to do. Um, and so that's that's a big part of the problem. But Nancy Pelosi there is um, it's a shell game that she's playing. Um, there are a lot of other things that are being uh, money being expended upon. And one could argue that in terms of infrastructure and support, and if you want to, like, I mean, look, when you lower the age of Medicare, and I'm not arguing for this in lieu of Medicare for all, arguing for it in lieu of increasing benefits for Medicare as it stands, or uh, even in conjunction with, when you lower the age of Medicare, you are doing a couple of things. You're obviously, uh, you're getting more people into about 20 million more Americans who are gonna be on a single payer system. You're probably getting very, very close at that point to a majority of Americans on a single payer system in this country, either Medicaid or Medicare. That 20 million may actually put it over the edge. Wow, yeah, can't and, have that. And you can't have that because then all of a sudden it's like, well, wait a second. We already have more than half of the country is on it and they love it. Why wouldn't we do this? But what you also do is the other sort of like knock on benefits are you're freeing up more people to maybe go into retirement or maybe go into semi retirement and opening up jobs for younger people and opportunities. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who stay working like 60 to 65 because like they need that health care till they get into Medicare. Um, you're opening up jobs for people. I mean, there's a whole host of reasons why we should be doing it, but of course. I, I also ahead. love the, uh, the, the bit that I don't want to get lost in there, but when he asks if we can, if uh, CMS can negotiate drug prices the same way the VA does. And she says, no, we can't do that, but when they do increase prices beyond inflation, we get a rebate check. It says nothing for the people who are actually paying for these drugs right. out of pocket in any way. Right. Just that the balance sheet looks good. Yep. It's sick. It really is sick. I mean, and it's sick to say that to Barkin's face specifically. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of like, there's a lot of gall there. Um, let's. Uh... Let's play one more clip. Uh, let's check in on Fox and Friends. We know that uh, Tucker Carlson's doing pretty well with his, um, the vaccine will lead to eugenics. What's going on at Fox and Friends? 
Hey, uh, let's talk about it and ask, uh, ask yourself if you have a problem with this. They're going to uh, knock on your door. They're going to demand that you take it, and they're going to give you a third shot. These are some of the things that are, are around, uh, have been banging around uh, in Washington about you and taking this vaccine. It's unbelievable how offensive this administration's getting with a pandemic that is clearly on the run. We're doing better than any other country. Basically, almost 60 to 70 percent of this country has taken two shots that are uh, adults in America. Yet this administration is panicking and they're infiltrating our lives. We need so, that Perry Mason sound there. Yeah, just uh, just to um, uh, just to recap on what uh, what what the argument is is yes, the, thank you. <laughs> the Biden administration's uh, vaccine uh, rollout has been so successful that uh, the pandemic's on the run, as it were. Now, of course, we have seen massive evidence that it is actually not on the run uh, in um, a lot of Midwestern states. I don't know, Missouri, um, I think in Oklahoma, we've got massive problems with the Delta variant. Um, it, the more that it plays around with unvaccinated people, the better chance you have of a variant developing and new variants we don't know are going to necessarily be um, as uh, dealt with as uh, by the vaccines as well as they are. And then, because he still needs to develop some outrage, he talks about things that are being knocked around. Well, the people knocking around the third vaccine is Pfizer. They know it's not uh, dangerous, and they say, like, it will double your, your antibodies. Okay. And the government said within moments after they made that uh, attempt to apply for a FDA approval for a third vaccine, the government said, we don't need it. There's no evidence we need it right now. We're going to focus on getting people vaccinated. And the idea that somebody's going to knock on your door and force you to take the vaccine is exists only in Brian Kilmeade's like producers wish list for segments. Right now, there may knock on your door to see if they can offer you a vaccine, but there is no no one's t even mentioned the idea of a vaccine mandate in a serious way. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad idea necessarily, but it's just not out there. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, and um, I mean, I I don't know how much producer involvement there is there it seemed like kill me just got really excited like a little kid and he turns to the camera and he couldn't even kind of complete one thought before moving on to the next one he really thought he had something there that could they're gonna, happen they're gonna come to your house they're gonna you know do what they did to britney spears do a whatever the the, the strapper into a gurney uh, strap you into a gurney and then just inject you with a third dose regardless of whether you want it or not and go. i'm a liberal and i'm saying it so you know you can trust that it's going to happen all right, folks, we have no more time for our calls. I'm going to take a couple IMs. I apologize, callers. Um, Illuminati kids, my mom is exactly the person you described who's wanting to retire now at 62, but is worried about what to do about health care. I've been keeping her updated on the info about the expansion from this show. Bummed that it's looking bad. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, let's go down here. Uh, Jimmy Dorable. Sam, I loved how in the crowd release from before the debate, he pretended not to know who you were by calling you the FM guy. But then as soon as you come on screen, he says your name instantly. Oh, that's right. Um, Anarcho PMC. Can Brendan give us a bye-bye for Sam's sleeves? Chardonnay Socialist. This just isn't <laughs> Donald Rubsod still dead. Um, oh, Anarcho PMC. Leisha Brooks is looking for people to uh, join a memorial show and talk about Michael's impact on them. Um, yes. Um, and you know what? We'll get the information that you can uh, send to, to Leisha. Um, we're, uh, you know, we're going to open up the phone lines on, on that day to, uh, to just basically have people uh, do something similar. Um, and, and Leisha will join us on that day as well. Um, what is the realistic possibility for the left to keep Eric Adams out of power by voting Republican in November? Call me crazy, but four years of Curtis Sewa sounds less depressing to me. Uh, unlikely. 
Emma jokes about a faked attempted murder four minutes later, metaphorically murders Sam over tank tops. Hmm. Um, uh, what was my, oh yes, yes. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm flexing my, my muscle. Uh, Bella, you're here. Uh, the most reprehensible part of Yucker Barlson is doing is using the actual problems of, uh, uh, of uh, by POC folks like myself have and continue to face uh, to rile up people who have no claim to any victimization when he knows damn well he wouldn't even acknowledge those things otherwise, and indeed didn't even say that eugenics targets non-white straight cis people, all just to send people to the mill for cash. Um, Non-cis straight people. Uh, if Crowder fans are going to show regular, we should start calling them muggles, or is it a pseudo racist slur written by a transphobic uh, children's book writer? A little too on the nose, says Quantum Bag Theory. Um, less. Okay, unfortunately, it's not just old folks walking Fox. Millennials and Gen Z are too. Quit thinking that once millennials and Z are in power, all will be good. Well, that kind of thinking is why we get our handed, our ass handed to us. You are in a bubble. If you look at the, the polling, uh, the data, I'm not quite sure about that, but. Uh, Sam's only fan. Hello, MR crew. Sam, I enjoyed your conversation yesterday with Bossom Yusuf and Francesca. Can we please have Bossom on MR, maybe on a Friday? He is hilarious. Well, that's an idea. Uh, Detroit Tal, uh, political science, economic, social sciences, intersections like Near Eastern studies for the caller asking about fields of study. Uh, and let's see what's we got sam i haven't gotten an email back from you guys about t-shirts i have to admit uh me calling you the real farmer was a bit of a joke but you have a very similar communication skills as my brother and agricultural news grain prices are down about a dollar this week but this has been a trend for the last several weeks bouncing up and down for the dollar ordinary prices don't move like this at a time of the year southwest drought is still bad and reservoirs are at historic lows brazilian second crop is seeing major problems with the leftist poggers we want you guys remind me to respond to um, Kowalski. I meant to do that. Uh, and two more callers. Ice Nine Miner. I'm from Alabama. This nutcase caller from, caller from Alabama has been reading too many Texas school books. I prefer real history, like what your guests give us on a regular basis. And the final I am of the day. Social Bear. I'm 50 and recently diagnosed with multiple myeloma. I have an employer-based insurance now, but can't stop worrying about the next 15 years before I'm on Medicare eligible. One of my drugs is $800 a pill for about 18,000 a month with a thousand dollar monthly copay. That's with insurance. I'm signed up for a copay assistance that covers most of that thousand, but I'll likely be on that drug for the rest of my life. If I lose my employment, my options become very limited, very expensive. And the Democrats have done nothing but spin their wheels since the ACA. Indeed hang in there hopefully hopefully something uh will turn but uh right now it doesn't look good matt brenda emma good job today guys <laughs> brenda brenda you call brenda yeah matt, you, emma, you mixed Brendan. emma and brenton <laughs> <laughs> emma brenda <laughs> oh it's friday <laughs> see you guys on monday it might take us through that guy to get to where I